Dear audience, dear colleagues, dear students, dear guests, I'm really delighted to see you here today and I warmly welcome you to the Paul Ehrlich Symposium. This event offers us the rare opportunity to present four awardees from two consecutive years in one symposium and to discuss with them some results of their excellent research in the footstep of Paul Ehrlich. It is in particular an honor to welcome the laureates, Bonnie Basler, Princeton University, who received the award 2021 together with Mike Silverman for the breakthrough discovery of bacterial communication. Kati Carico, Biontech Mainz, who received the award 2022 together with Eslim Turici and Urgo Shahin for the research and the development of mRNA-based therapeutic approaches. Elvira Mas, University Bonn Early Career Award 2021, for her research contribution to the development of tissue-derived macrophages in health and disease, and Laura Hinze, Hannover Medical School Early Career Award 2022, for the discovery of metabolic pathways in resistance of tumors. I'm delighted that you all have accepted the invitation to this special event after these very, very busy days of the award ceremony. So now you can here really relax and have a, a wild discussion today. I also like to thank Joachim Peach, freelance journalist of Wissenswort Communication Paul Ehrlich Foundation for sharing and moderating the four lectures and the two discussion rounds. With the symposium, we honor Paul Ehrlich, who died in Bad Homburg, which is very close here to Frankfurt, on August 20, 1915. As a physician and scientist, Paul Ehrlich worked in the fields of hematology, immunology, and antimicrobial therapy, all topics of today's symposium. He invented, invented the pioneering technique of Kram staining of bacteria and thus um, also staining methods of tissues which distinguish him different types of blood cells and thus diagnose numerous blood diseases. Paul Ehrlich contributed to the development of an antiserum to combat diphtheria and conceived the method for standardizing therapeutic sera. His lab discovered Salvasan for the first effective draft of the treatment of syphilis, thereby establishing the concept of chemotherapy and the concept of a magic bullet. We deliberately choose the name of the symposium, not a magic bullet, but Zauberkugel, and you will realize because we go through very heavy days. In 1908, he received the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in recognition of his outstanding contributions in immunology. Today, in the spirit of Paul Ehrlich, we will address several aspects of current research in our two discussion rounds. Will quorum quenching strategies pave the way to overcome antibiotic resistance? How do fetal-derived immune cells influence long life health? And will mRNA-based therapeutics soon meet a plethora of unfilled, unfulfilled medical needs? Which signaling pathways offer new trackable targets for the treatment of tumors? Due to the pandemic situation, we had to organize this symposium as a streaming event, allowing guests to participate only remotely. I would therefore welcome you kindly uh, to stay in time, 20 minutes plus five minutes discussion. And we cordially invite the audience to ask questions during the presentation and pan panel discussions via email. And uh, you may see the email address in the teaser as well as in our banner. Very importantly, I'd like to thank all sponsors for their outstanding support of this symposium, the planning of which was not trivial in these pandemic and difficult times. First and foremost, 
the founder and Förderer of the Goethe University Frankfurt, as well as several research centers founded by the German Research Foundation, DFG, namely the Sonderforschungsbereich 902 on molecular principles of RNA-based regulation, the Sonderforschungsbereich 1080 on neural homeostasis, the Frankfurt Cancer Institute sponsored by the Löwe program, and the Excellence Initiative scale on quantitative analysis of subcellular architecture. Without their generous support, the organization of the symposium would not have been possible. Last but not least, as a matter of heart, I would like to mention our solidarity to Ukraine. Then Thursday, February 24th, Russia has been militarily attacking Ukraine. Our solidarity goes to all people in Ukraine, especially the Ukrainian colleagues, scientists and students who fear for their future. We appeal to all those responsible to work for peace and a quick end of the war. As the DFG president Katja Becker put it yesterday in the prize ceremony, biomedical research saves life, whereas war destroys them. Despite this threatening situation, I wish you all an inspiring symposium, particularly for the students, our next generation, looking for upcoming emerging topics, and I hope we hear a lot emerging topics today, but also for the colleagues discussing future avenues for exciting experimental approaches and data. With these open marks, I would like to hand over to Joachim Peach, sharing the session. Well, thank you, Robert, for this introduction, and thank you, more importantly, for organizing this symposium, and welcome out there in cyberspace to the audience. i just like to say before I start that it's one of the pleasures of my life to be on stage with these eminent scientists today. Our first speaker whom I'd like to introduce is Bonnie Basler. She is the chair of the Department of Molecular Biology at the University of Princeton. And as an undergraduate in biochemistry, Bonnie was disappointed when she was assigned to a project studying bacteria. Boring little things, she thought, but soon she learned better and word by word, she unveiled the amazing ability of bacteria to communicate with each other and in several chemical languages. Bonnie, you have been inspiring the field of microbiology for almost three decades now. My lab was built on crazy ideas like bacteria talking to each other, uh, you once said or you recently said, and how the courage to pursue these crazy ideas still pays off today, we'll hear from you now. Bonnie, please, the screen is yours. Well, thank you. Um, it's an absolute delight. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, and I'm really um, happy to get to kick off this symposium with three wonderful colleagues and new friends that we've had to be able to share this incredible celebration together these last few days. And so you already got a good introduction. I work on, how, or my gang works on how bacteria communicate and work as groups. And what I want to tell you today is some brand new science from our lab about how communication transcends kingdom boundaries. So to get into that, let me just give you a little background. What we always wonder is how bacteria can do all these powerful, magical, and horrible things that they manage. They're so small. And so what we've shown is the way bacteria uh, carry out many tasks is by working together as groups. They communicate, they count their numbers, and they turn on genes only and behaviors only when they're in communities, but not when they're alone. And that process you're looking at a cartoon of on the first slide, we call it quorum sensing. 
So on the left part of the slide, what you see is a cartoon of the quorum sensing system. So bacteria have to understand times when they're alone from times when they're in communities and behave differently. And so the way that they do it is by making and releasing small molecules, which are shown as the red triangles. And so when bacteria are alone, the auto these small molecules, which we call autoinducers, diffuse away and the bacteria can't detect them. And that says behave as an individual. But then as the bacteria grow and divide, since all of the bacteria in the community are making and releasing a share of these autoinducers, these signal molecules, the extracellular concentration of the molecules increases in proportion to cell number. And when those molecules hit a particular threshold amount, the bacteria detect it, all of them change their behavior together, and they begin to carry out collective or group behaviors. And there are hundreds and hundreds of behaviors that are under these quorum sensing circuits, so it is a big deal when the bacterium decides to change from going it alone to acting as part of a group. And that is controlled by these quorum sensing communication circuits. There are a number of molecules involved that we think of as words. Some words say, you are my clone. Some words say, you are my cousin. Some <laughs> words say, you are not related to me. And the bacteria measure the blend of molecules, and they decide what to do based on the cell number in the environment and also how closely or distantly my neighbor is. So they tailor these behaviors based on whether they're around friend or foe. And so that's how quorum sensing works across the bacterial domain. And so now let me get a little closer and tell you a little bit about the molecular details on one of the systems that we work on. And so today my story will be about Vibrio cholera, which you probably know is a pandemic bacterium that causes a terrible diarrheal disease. And cholera is this insidious bacterium. You get it by drinking contaminated food or water, and the sort of strategy the bacterium has is to get in, grow like crazy, and then get out in this diarrheal disease by the gazillions to infect the next patient. So it's all about dissemination and spread. And so quorum sensing controls virulence and that ability of cholera to spread. And so my lab discovered quorum sensing cholera. There are multiple quorum sensing systems that feed in to make that switch happen. But I want to tell you about the newest one that we discovered recently. Okay, and so this new quorum sensing system works in conjunction with canonical quorum sensing systems that we had discovered earlier. So what a German postdoc named Kai Pappenport discovered was that there was a receptor, which he calls VQMA, that you can see on that slide, for Vibrio Quorum A. There was a receptor that at low cell density turns on biofilm formation, which is how cholera sits on the intestinal surface, and virulence factor in expression. So when cholera enters the host, it's sort of guns blazing, it sits on the, the surface, it makes a biofilm, and it secretes all these virulence factors, and the host gets Gets sick, the human host gets sick. But then as the bacteria grow and divide in the intestine, quorum sensing kicks in. So they make a molecule that we named DPO that accumulates with cell number, and at high cell density, it binds the VQMA receptor, so you're seeing that on the right-hand side, and that, when the autoinducer binds the receptor, it turns on a small RNA, which is like a microRNA in bacteria, and that microRNA turns off biofilm formation, turns off virulence, and turns on the escape program. So what you see is that low cell density on the left, cholera is infectious. At high cell density, quorum sensing makes it escape, and it infects the next patient. Justin Silpi, a graduate student in the lab, discovered the structure of that new molecule called DPO. And so now I'm showing that on the bottom of the slide. It's a tiny little six-membered molecule with two nitrogens in it, and it is a brand new molecule to mankind. And we call it DPO because that has to do with its chemical name. So DPO is the autoinducer that launches that circuit. So when Justin and Kai had gotten about this far in their um, studies, Justin made this strange observation. What we could show is that DPO, the molecule, was broadly made in the bacterial kingdom, but the receptor, VQMA, was only in Vibrios. So every Vibrio bacterium has a VQMA protein, but no bacterium except Vibrios have a VQMA protein. And so Justin was confused about this asymmetry between autoinducer production and autoinducer detection. And so he was kind of hunting around, looking at databases, and he actually found another VQMA receptor. 
but it wasn't in a bacterium. He found it in a phage, in a virus. So phages are viruses that infect bacteria. And so what you're looking at is the uh, part of the genome of the phage that Justin discovered. It's a vibrio phage, so it infects vibrios, and there's a bunch of genes on it. And you see right in the middle, in purple, there was this gene that looked like it had a core it encoded a quorum sensing receptor. And that was sort of remarkable to us because there had never been a viral component to quorum sensing. Quorum sensing is supposed to be about bacteria talking to each other. And so we wondered, what's this receptor doing on this phage? So we got our hands on this phage and we started to study it. And so this little phage lives as a plasmid. It gets into host cells and it never integrates in the chromosome. It just hangs around as a plasmid as a virus. And on the right-hand side, which you can see color-coded, there were genes that we could understand called C1, Q, and lysis genes. And these genes basically come out of a textbook from sort of canonical, um, sort of seminal studies from Lambda. And I'll tell you how those work now. So what you may have learned when you studied you know, biology 101 is that phages, when they get into a host bacterium, they have to decide stay or go, stay or go. So lysogeny or lysis, lysogeny or lysis. And the way they do that are with those genes that I just showed you. So there's a protein called C1 that's a repressor that keeps the, the, the anti-repressor Q off. So when the, when the phage is a lysogen, Lysis genes are repressed, as you see on that slide. But whenever the host cell gets into trouble, if there's SOS or DNA damage, the phage is like, I'm out of here. And what happens is that the C1 protein is cleaved, that unleashes Q, and Q turns on the lysis genes, and the phage kills the host. So in this new phage that Justin found, we could see those genes in the genome, and Justin did the classic experiments, and it works exactly as I told you. When there's DNA damage or SOS, that right-hand part of the genome engages, and the phage kills the host and escapes. So we didn't want to rediscover that. That has been done for 150 years. What we wondered is here. Why is there a quorum sensing receptor gene on a phage, and why is our quorum sensing receptor gene on this phage. And so we wanted to try to explore that question. And so I had just told you that we had recently studied or discovered the VQMA receptor, and we also had discovered the autoinducer DPO that launches the receptor in cholera. So we saw this gene, and we only knew how to do one thing, which is to add the autoinducer. So we did that. So now what you're looking at, this is a growth curve. So there's growth on the y-axis over time. You're just looking at a growth curve of Vibrio cholera that that Justin has transformed with the phage. And what you can see is that cholera grows just fine. But then, if Justin adds the autoinducer, DPO, and so he made a chemical synthesis, we can make buckets of this stuff. If he adds that DPO autoinducer, it binds the phage receptor. And now if you look at the white circles, what happens is that all of the cells die. So what that means is that this virus is eavesdropping on the host quorum sensing program. The bacterium is growing, the, the cell density is getting higher, DPO is accumulating, and that phage is listening in, and at high cell density, it monitors that autoinducer, and then it executes the host. And so our interpretation of that result is that this is like surveillance, right? So remember, when a phage decides to leave its current host and, get, and, you know, and go out into the world, if it doesn't get into another bacterium, it's a goner. So when's a really good time to kill the host? Well, at high cell density. So this phage is waiting. It's listening in to this quorum sensing language, waiting till the host gets at high number, and then it kills it, and that maximizes transmission of the phage to the next cell. So anyway, so Justin had then found this connection now between this phage quorum sensing eavesdropping mechanism and lysis of the phage. And so he wanted to understand how is this new quorum sensing circuit connected to those seminal, you know, canonical proteins, C1 and Q, that we know launched the lysis cascade. So he wondered how is this circuit wired? And so there were some sort of easy ideas, right? So VQMA is a transcription factor. It's a DNA binding protein. So we thought, well, maybe VQMA just turns on Q, and then lysis happens. So Justin tested that. Completely wrong. We said, OK, we'll step our way up the circuit. Maybe it represses the repressor. That would also launch lysis. So Justin tested that. 
completely wrong. So now we were out of components that we understood from phage uh, history, and so we had to infer with the little question mark that there was something missing. There was some new component that connects phage quorum sensing to the lysis machinery, and Justin wanted to find that new player. So he thought up a genetic screen, and so I'll just explain the logic to you of Justin's experiment. What you get, right, is it's all about Q. If Q turns on, lysis happens. So what Justin did was he made a promoter fusion, a transcriptional fusion of the promoter from Q to the luciferase genes. So now if Q turns on, the bacteria make light. And he put that, that fusion, C1, and the VQMA protein into laboratory E. coli. So now those E. coli are dark, right, because there's something missing. The circuit is not complete. So these cells are dark. And then what Justin thought is if he could figure out, if he could clone the component that acts downstream of VQMA, the cells would turn bright. And so what he did was he just chopped up the phage genome, it's only like 40 KB, and he made a little library of phage genes, and he transformed that library into the E. coli carrying the components you see on the top line. And then what he just did is a really simple experiment. He turned the lights off in the room and looked for an E. coli that made light, figuring that he would have gotten that component that acts in between. And sure enough, he did. He got exactly one gene out of that screen, and we could sequence that gene, and we had the genome of the phage, so we could just find out where is that gene on this phage. And so it turns out that it was immediately to the left of the quorum sensing receptor. So there was a little gene right there that I have in the box that encodes a 78 amino acid protein, so a tiny little protein. And when we did database analyses, there is nothing in the database, nothing in any organism that resembles that protein. So it's a brand new protein, and Justin got to name it. So he calls that protein Q-tip for quorum triggered inactivator of C1 protein, so Q-tip. So the next task for Justin is how does Q-tip link quorum sensing to phage lysis in this eavesdropping virus? And so I'm just, he did a bunch of experiments and I'll just show you the answer. Q-tip sequesters that C1 repressor. So what you're looking at, this is E. coli where we took a picture of it under a microscope and in E. coli, Justin's put the C1 repressor and it has a halo tag so it's green. And so what you can see is that it's all diffuse in the cytoplasm, you know, the C1 is just throughout the cytoplasm. So now if Justin puts Q-tip in with C1, what you can see is that all the C1 gets, makes these big oligomers and goes to the poles as this glop. And so now you understand why the protein is called Q-tip, because these E. coli look like little Q-tips to us. And so the job of Q-tip is to sequester C1 and inactivate it. And sure enough, Justin showed on the left-hand side that C1 is active, on the right-hand side that C1 is inactive. Okay, so now let me try to put together what's going on. What we think is there are two inputs into this lifestyle decision that the phage makes between lysogeny and lysis. The first input is classic. It's DNA, it's SOS. C1 gets cleaved, Q is made, and lysis happens. The second input is new, it's quorum sensing. It's a phage quorum sensing eavesdropping mechanism. At high cell density, the phage receptor binds the autoinducer, turns on the production of that little protein Q-tip, Q-tip drags C1 out of solution and inactivates it. And so the outcome is the same, Q gets made and the host cell gets killed. So the fate of C1 is different. In one case it's cleaved, in one case it's in an inclusion body, but the outcome to the cell is it's a goner. So there's two inputs. There's also two quorum sensing systems running here. So you'll remember at the very, the first slide, what remember cholera is doing quorum sensing, right? So remember I told you, cholera has its own VQMA receptor. It monitors the DPO molecule, turns on that small RNA, and that small RNA controls 600 genes in cholera. And so what Justin showed is that the phage receptor also controls all of those genes. So while this phage is getting ready to kill the host, it's messing with the entire quorum sensing regulon of the host. We have no idea what good it does, that phage, to be able to change the host biology. We just know it happens. 
Okay, so once we got that far, we started to understand the mechanism. But then what Justin, what we wondered, is this just some crazy one-off of this phage that we happen to find? And so now that Justin had that little, that little uh, module with both Q-tip and VQMA, he could do more sophisticated database analyses. And what we saw is there are lots and lots of phages that are put together like this. This is not a one-off. There are all of these phages that have a transcription factor that binds some stimulus, and right next door is a Q-tip-like protein, so the little or gene. So the little red genes have no homology to one another, but they are functionally equivalent. We cloned all of those, and every one of those will sequester every one of the C1s. So they all work the same. So what we think then is that these phages are eavesdropping on host biology. In the case I told you, the phage that we studied is monitoring quorum sensing. In the other cases, these phages are monitoring some kind of appropriate host information and using this new anti-repressor mechanism, they're driving lysis. So it is not true that phages only monitor SOS and DNA damage. We would say actually they're tuned in to all kinds of host information. So the last thing I'll tell you is that we tried to do something practical after we made these basic studies. So Justin thought, okay, what these phages are doing is they're re-engineering these circuits to be tuned in to different inputs. And he thought, well, if the phage can do that, I can do that. And so he made a little set of phage therapies that kill pathogenic bacteria on demand. And I'm just going to show you one example. He made a whole set of these. You can use your imagination for how these work. So what you get is it's all about Q. When Q turns on, lysis happens. And you'll remember, I told you the phage is a plasmid. We can put this plasmid into any bacterial cell. It doesn't have host restriction because it's a plasmid. So you can transform it in. So what Justin did was he simply changed the promoter for Q on the phage. And so I'll just give you one example. He took a promoter from Salmonella that's called INVF. So when Salmonella is going to be a pathogen, there's a transcription factor called HIL-A that under pathogenic conditions, HIL-A turns on INVF and Salmonella invades host cells. So what Justin did was he put INVF, just 100 bases of Salmonella DNA, onto the phage. We put the phage in Salmonella, right, so it has nothing to do with Vibrios. We put it in Salmonella. We put Salmonella under virulence conditions, and HIL-A did its job. It bound at INVEF. The problem was INVEF was on the phage, Q turned on, and all the Salmonella committed suicide. And so what you get is you can make these um, phages tuned to any input. You know, I told you Justin made six or ten of them, right? And so if you know the input, you can kill cells on demand. And so we hope that this little toy uh, phage therapy will be very useful to colleagues that do work that's much more applied than we do, right? And that maybe perhaps someone could make something useful out of this new knowledge about this phage. And so now for my last slide, I'll put it all together. So cholera is this intestinal pathogen. It gets into the human host, and it has to decide, stay or go, stay or go. And the way it decides that is through quorum sensing, through multiple molecules, one of which is DPO. When DPO accumulates, cholera escapes the host to infect the next victim. What I haven't told you is that your microbiome bacteria make DPO, and you provide them the substrate. So your microbiome lives on a protein called mucin. Every third amino acid in mucin is threonine. DPO is made from threonine and alanine. So you, the human host, give your microbiome DP, or the threonine, your microbiome makes DPO and cholera miscounts. So what happens is your microbiome makes cholera confused, they, they miscount, and they actually disperse early. And so it's known that people get more or less severe cholera. We think infection, we think it's because of this molecule. And then now I have to add the parasite of the parasite in here. So now there's this phage that's also trying to decide stay or go, stay or go. It's listening into this DPO molecule and deciding when to be in its current host or when to escape to the next uh, victim, in this case, a bacterial cell. And so I have to confess, we don't know how anybody counts robustly anymore. All of these players are making and using DPO, and somehow this works out to tell these bacteria and these viruses to make these major lifestyle transitions. And so that's where we are. We're trying to do experiments that are more authentic and sort of have lots of players in them that are more realistic um, now.
And then I'll finish just by telling you today's hero. This is Justin Silpy. He was a graduate student in the lab, and now he's a postdoc, and he's just an absolutely spectacular uh, scientist. And he did all of the DPO and phage work that I talked about. So thank you for letting me tell you this new story. I'm super delighted to be here and uh, get to share it with you. Bonnie, for this, I would say, mind-boggling uh, <laughs> presentation, because it's certainly much more than a toy that you have discovered. You have opened up an, an, a window or a door into a really new way of understanding the communication of viruses and bacteria, because this uh, phage has 70 genes, right? No yeah. more. And it reserves exclusively one gene to eavesdrop on what happens in bacteria to decide whether it should stay or kill uh, the bacteria. Uh, I mean, this is uh, something that was not uh, anticipated before that it exists. And uh, yeah, so I would think I think so. I think you know, so. Like in retrospect, you think, oh, that's so smart. Of course, kill the host at high cell density. That's when there's lots of other cells around. But of course. We weren't anticipating that quorum sensing you know, could cross all these kingdom boundaries. I mean, phages aren't even in a kingdom, right? And um, so we thought that was really interesting that these phages are tuned in to host sensory inputs. Yeah. OK, I have two uh, more okay. specific questions here, please, from the audience. Um, we are very happy to receive these questions after your talk. How does P-tip, uh, Q-tip, uh, this was a, a, a typo, typo. Q-tip find to single pole of PF E. coli to sequester CL. I hope I, I, there are it? several typos, obviously, in this question. I, I interpret it as how does Q-tip find to single pole PF E. coli to sequester CL? So how, I, 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 I interpret it so how does it find the pole? Oh, the pole, where, where yeah, okay, thank you, I get it, CN. okay, yeah. So, um, so Q-tip, there are two amino acids, so Justin did a mutagenesis of Q-tip, there are two amino acids in Q-tip, even though it's only 78 amino acids, two amino acids that are required for interaction with C1, and then there's a different amino acid that is required for localization to the pole, yeah. right? And so how it knows to go there, we don't know, and we also want to be careful, I'm not sure there's biology there, whenever, in bacteria, it's really common when you get these big oligomers and you get inclusion bodies, they typically fall out at the pole. And so it could be that there's not biology there, that that's just a, a product of the inclusion bodies, right? But we know there's an amino acid for localization. Yeah. And how, uh, that was a second question, how can such a small protein, which is not yeah, more yeah, yeah. than a polypeptide, find its target? Right, so we're, um, that drives us wild. Uh, so, you, so it's 78 <coughs> amino acids. So I already told you we did this mutagenesis. So we know particular amino acids that are about interaction, particular amino acids that are about going to the pole, or, you know, so localization. So we can separate those two functions. And so you'd think, oh, well, how easy, you know, my lab does a lot of biochemistry. We do a lot of crystallography. We have crystals, all that. we make these molecules. You know, how hard can this be? So it turns out when you try to purify Q-tip, it's a really sticky protein, and it comes out as this enormous, monstrous oligomer. And so we don't have a crystal structure, to my lab's embarrassment, we don't have a crystal structure of Q-tip. We, we're trying to get it in. We think maybe it binds C1 as they're folding. And so we're right now trying to get the complex to answer exactly that question. And it's not willy-nilly, right? It only binds C1. It's not like it goes around sequestering all kinds of other proteins in the the cell, it's that protein, right? And so we would love to know the answer to that. You know, it's a brand new protein. We don't know how it works. Um, yeah. Let us just go back to the host, to the uh, to Vibrio cholerae. Why in the first place would it be interested uh, to have uh, at a certain quorum um, an inhibition of biofilm formation and virulence? Because yeah. this uh, seems to be contradictory to the uh, aims that a bacterium right. should have. Right. So. Cholera causes an acute infection. So you're right, in many quorum sensing bacteria, pathogens, the idea is to get in the host and stay as long as you can. You know, so biofilms and virulence turn on at high cell density. But cholera has this different strategy. It causes an, an acute infection and it's get in and get out. And so it has to have quorum sensing or it's not a pathogen, but it's all about escape and dissemination so at high cell numbers. From, it doesn't, yeah, yeah. Okay. so it has yeah. the, so these bacteria have tinkered with quorum sensing based on the kinds of diseases they cause that, that chronic bacteria turn on those factors at high cell density. Acute 
disease-causing bacteria, turn them off. So all they had to do was switch the arrow at the bottom of the cascade, okay. right, to make yeah. that happen. And then it has to do with the kinds of disease. Okay, uh, thank you very much. We have one last question okay. from the audience. What can we learn from the quorum sensing network for synthetic biology? Oh, Killing on demand? Oh yeah, absolutely. I so mean, the synthetic biologists have been all over the quorum sensing, um, both the phage part now, but also just the original quorum sensing circuits because nature gave us the molecules. You can turn these on and off in demand. You can design these, you can put them in tandem. And so they're really, really cool for engineering into synthetic circuits and being able to drive them precisely, quantitatively, right? Because you just add the molecule. And so I think they're an incredible boon to the synthetic biology field, right? And, I, and they're used a lot, right? And they hopefully will be used more, including this new phage one, because that's got some cute features. Yeah. Thank so you very thank much you very for much. your presentation. We'll yeah. have more time in the Absolutely. first panel discussion. Absolutely, a delight. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Bonnie. <clears throat> We move on to Elvira Mas, professor of, at the Life and Medical Sciences Institute at the University of Bonn. She originally wanted to become a medical doctor, but was not admitted to medical school. So she decided to study biology and dove so deeply into the origins of uh, developmental biology that her research has really changed some chapters of textbooks for medical schools uh, now, at least those for immunology and those uh, which lead us further uh, to the understanding of what macrophages do, uh, because these immune cells obviously do not only defend us, but also help to develop us um, with severe consequences, because if they fail to do so uh, correctly, uh, it uh, can lead not only to disease, but also to increase disease acceptability. We'll hear more from you, Elvira, please. Uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thanks a lot for the wonderful introduction. And I'm very happy to be here today, very honored to be here with the other laureates. And yes, we are trying to change the textbooks. It's still not happening a lot, but I hope that in a few years and decades we will be thus far. So we work on macrophages and what role they play in health and disease in um, all of our tissues. And just to bring you into the picture, so what are macrophages in general? Macrophages belong to the myelid cell lineage of our innate immune system. And here you can see such an example of a macrophage displayed here or genetically labeled in green. So they really have a very sessile cell body and they have the long stretch philopodia with their, they survey basically their tissue. And this is why macrophages have been in, in the focus of immunologists in the past because of their highly phagocytic function and the production of pro-inflammatory factors. And this is an example of a kidney macrophage that is phagocytosing nano-sized beads from the blood vasculature. However, recently macrophages got into the focus of developmental biologists and I'm one of them. And this is really something that led to rewriting of uh, textbooks. So in the past, macrophages have been considered as the main contributors to different disease pathologies such as neurological disorders, metabolic syndromes, or chronic inflammation. And the long-term time belief was for many decades that these cells all develop from monocytes that stem from hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow. However, there was a big paradigm shift roughly 10 years ago showing that there are other macrophages, monocyte-derived macrophages do exist, but most tissue-resident macrophages actually derive from a fetal progenitor. And they come from a so-called erythromyelid progenitor or EMP from in the yolk sac. And depending on the tissue they reside in, they may carry different names, for instance, microglia in the brain or kupfer cells in the liver and Langerhans cells in the skin. So macrophages are not all the same, but they represent two distinct hematopoietic lineages. And when I, as a developmental biologist, joined this immunology field, it was unclear why this dichotomy exists and whether it persists throughout different immunological scenarios or diseases. So we first tried to understand why we would care about such a developmental um, certification. 
would developmental origin actually define cell function? And if that would be the case, would it mean then that also the origin of a cell would um, kind of play a role in disease ontogeny or progression? And now if you think about that uh, fetal-derived cells, of course, develop together with the organ, it will sit deep within the organ, the parenchyme, and it will not be as accessible as a cell that will stem from monocytes that can be targeted um, uh, by drugs, for instance, while they're still circulating uh, in the blood. So we knew that these populations coexist at the point when I entered the field, and this is shown in the, in the scheme, but what we did not know is when the cells sit side by side upon inflammation, whether once the inflammation is resolved, the monocyte-derived macrophages here displayed in, in blue, whether they would disappear and how it will all work. So to answer all of these questions, we first set out to, to work on or to describe the development of tissue-resident macrophages in more detail. And what we could show is actually that it's not as easy. So we have basically these cells that we know they come from the yolk sac, but there's also not a precursor in between. So it's still not a macrophage. You can usually use an F480 as a typical marker for these cells, but you have a precursor that is circulating throughout the embryo, throughout development. And we could describe that these cells they acquire a core macrophage program. And here you see such a heat map showing gene expression. So on the left-hand side, we have the EMPs from different organs, the yolk sac, the fetal liver. And on the right-hand side, we have very early macrophages. And for those who do not know, a mouse, this is from a mouse, a mouse develops within 19 to 21 days. And this is around day E9 to E10. So really early, uh, we see these macrophages appearing. And this pre-macrophage will acquire already some of the program that you will find in tissue-resident macrophages. So this precursor will circulate, will extravasate, and will immediately differentiate into tissue-specific macrophages. And what is interesting is that this is driven by a transcriptional network that will really make these cells very specific for a certain tissue. And we looked here at five different tissues, the brain, the liver, the skin, the kidney and the lung. And you can appreciate here that very early, as soon as we find these macrophages in these tissues, they will immediately specify. And some of these factors were already described, so it was really a proof of principle that these cells develop so early. But we could define new factors, for instance, it one and it three, that are very important for the development of Kupfer cells in the liver. So having this developmental map now at hand, we were finally kind of in a situation where we could test this hypothesis or, the, or, or answer these questions we had. Would really the developmental origin play a role how a cell function, functions? So, um, and I would like to demonstrate to you today that developmental origin is really important taking the brain as a model organism. And to this end, I would like to introduce to you a disease called histocytosis. And these are clonal myelid disorders that are um, characterized by the accumulation and proliferation of macrophages and other immune cells. And this disease is quite heterogeneous, so patients present with skin and bone lesions, but also with lung and liver fibrosis. But what is quite interesting is that many of these patients actually show also neurodegenerative symptoms. And this was quite puzzling. But more and more um, data was acquired, and what was discovered in the first time in 2010 is that actually, if you now sequence these lesions, that you have a lot of activating somatic mutations in this rough, um, rough, rough mec erg signaling pathway, with the most frequent one being BRAF V600E. And this usually leads to this proliferation of the cells. And it was considered that as for macrophage origin back then, that actually mutated cells from the bone marrow would go into the tissue and ca cause these diseases that are so heterogeneous. But why or how could a cell coming from a bone marrow um, cause neurodegenerative symptoms since microglia that would develop already early during development uh, that are the tissue-resident macrophages of the brain, how can they be mutated in that case? So to answer or to try and to address all of these different open questions, we set out to study this in a mouse model first. So with a distinct origin 
mean a distinct disease maybe. So what we did is to introduce this BRF V600 E mutation into hematopoietic stem cells or into HSC-derived myelid cells. On the contrary, we introduced this into the EMPs in the York sac. And what happens is the following. If you have BRF V600E in hematopoietic stem cells, this will lead to prenatal death because the, the embryos die of a leukemic-like phenotype. And if you have them in the myelid cells, this will lead to myelid cell tumors in the lung or in the spleen. However, if you introduce this now into EMPs, this will result in a small fraction of mutant microglia, roughly 15%. But this is sufficient to drive neurodegeneration in all the adult mice that, that we ever looked at. And the BRF mutation in microglia will lead to their increased proliferation. They will start producing neurotoxic cytokines such as IL-1 and IL-17. And this in turn will lead to neurodegeneration, astragliosis, demyelination, and also the production of uh, amyloid precursor protein, APP which is well known as a marker for Alzheimer's diseases. But this also represents a phenotype that histocytosis patients have also in their brains. So it's a very good model uh, for histocytosis um, and neurodegeneration. And this means then, to just sum this up, that tissue-resident macrophages really sit at the interface between tissue homeostasis and pathogenesis. And for the first time, we could show that these cells are not just contributing, but can actually cause disease such as neurodegeneration. So what about the cell function of macrophages? Can two macrophages here displayed in yellow and blue with different origins have different responses to the same inflammatory conditions? And we addressed this together with Ralf Sturm from Jena, taking stroke as a model. Um, as a model. We introduced brain damage um, using stroke. And we did that in mice um, that he developed, the so-called CXCF4 CREAR-T mice. So what this is, this mouse, why is it so important? Well, it allows us for the first time very efficiently to label all the cells that are coming from the bone marrow. So they will be labeled TD tomato or will be red. So you can follow them really after tamoxifen injection of the mice. However, microglia, the macrophages of the brain, will not be labeled. So we can really follow this uh, mice spatial temporarily. So what we could see is that after stroke, we have an influx of monocytes, and we have a confinement of monocyte-derived macrophages to the lesion site. And this, in turn, will lead to the activation and proliferation of surrounding microglia. However, with time, monocyte-derived macrophages will disappear, and microglia will go back to their homostatic state and repopulate the lesion area. And so we concluded here that there's really a crosstalk between monocyte-derived macrophages and microglia and that they really have different jobs upon stroke. And to test this, we inhibited monocyte influx into the brain, and it's really changed the outcome um, of stroke. So we had um, worse behavior in mice, and this was due to increased lesion size. Microglia stopped proliferating, and they, they remained active, producing uh, pro-inflammatory um, cytokines. So yes, we think ontogeny does determine function, at least here in the stroke scenario. And we know here that these cells, as you see on the right-hand side within the scheme, they will disappear, the monocyte-derived macrophages will disappear. But we still do not know whether that is the case also in other scenarios and diseases and how it actually works. And this is where we kind of start, start in my lab to work um, on this because now the macrophage toolbox is really expanding. We have the fir very first time really the means to study all of, um, of these questions. And what we do um, is to try to address whether macrophages play really a causative role in different disease scenarios. So what we know is that the maternal environment, for instance, nutrition, or any kind of environmental exposures will cause different diseases in the offspring, such as metabolic diseases or neuro, uh, neurodevelopmental, neurodegenerative diseases. However, the mechanisms causing this remain unknown. And this is where we would like to place tissue-resident macrophages because these cells, we know this now, they are long-lived, they develop together with the organ, they remain there and in humans for decades. So they really may remember whatever happened environmentally. So we think that they can basically 
undergo developmental programming, be it in, uh, by, by cytokines or lipids, that they can then, if they're reprogram reprogrammed, that they cannot fulfill their homeostatic function but become activated, and this would then in turn cause disease. And I brought two examples with me today to shortly introduce to you the concept and why we think this is really happening. So one big environmental problem, of course, is the, is the epidemic of, of obesity in our world. And this leads also to a big number of pregnant women that are overweight or obese. And we try to mimic this in the lab, of course, in mice again. So we developed a maternal obesity model. We put mice on a high fat diet until they develop a metabolic syndrome. But what we do then is we put the offspring to a controlled diet mum. So the offspring will never see uh, obesity for all their life. And what happens is when we looked here at the liver, because it's a highly metabolic organ, is the following. So what you stain here for is oil red O, is, is staining neutral lipids in the liver. And you can see that the offspring coming from uh, maternally obese mums will suffer from a fatty liver disease. And this is also known for non-human primates, but also ultrasounds in humans indicate that this is also the case in humans. Of course, you would like to see the causality between macrophages and, and, and this fatty liver disease. This is at least our idea. So we looked what these macrophages are doing and how they're changing. And what we see is that these cells undergo a metabolic switch from oxidative phosphorylation to glycolysis. And this is accompanied by the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF or I1. And these are cytokines that are well known to control hepatocyte function. So really, this makes really a lot of sense that this would be the crosstalk and what could cause the disease. And to really test this causality, we took, again, advantage of our developmental atlas of macrophages and used the following model. So we used this TNF-RSF11A Cree because this gene is very specific in pre-macrophages or PMAX. And we can reduce cup for cell numbers by knocking out IT1 and IT3 that we described to be important for their development. And this alone, the reduction of cup for cells during development is sufficient to rescue the phenotype. And we have new data showing that if we prohibit copper cells to undergo metabolic switch from oxidative uh, phosphorylation to glycolysis, we also can rescue this phenotype. So everything hints towards the fact that copper cells or macrophages in this case are really this intergenerational messengers that can memorize the maternal obesity and cause disease. Another diet that we are on and we, we may not want it and cannot control it is a plastic diet. And we do not really know whether this plastic bottle that you see here that will be degraded into micro and nanoplastics, whether it is hazardous to our immune system. And we try to address that in our nanoglia project and try to see and understand whether nano or microplastics can accumulate in the brain and particularly in microglia, and thereby cause neurodevelopmental or neurodegenerative disease. And if you now think, but I, look, I have my blood-brain barrier, and before that I have my, my gut barrier, or maybe my placental barrier, how can this plastic even enter my brain? I have to disappoint you, because if we take nanoplastics and we give it to mice, and we look 24 hours later, then we can see that depending on the size, that the plastic will enter the brain. Here we took fluorescent polystyrene, and anything below or as a size of 100 nanometers will be found in the brain. And there it is found preferentially in microglia that are here labeled in magenta with IBA1. And on the right hand side, you can see a 3D rendering picture, really, that you can see the polystyrene within the cell. So to sum up, we depend on a proper development of tissue resident macrophages for organ development and function. But it is also important that these cells are activated and respond to inflammatory stimuli. It is as important that these cells will go back to their homeostatic state because that's also important that the, the organ goes back to homeostasis. And if that does not happen, be it due to somatic mutations or due to let's say, maternal obesity or any kind of developmental programming, or maybe just simply due to aging, these macrophages will become chronically active and then 
be, will be able to cause diseases such as metabolic or neurological diseases. And with this, I would like to really thank my fantastic lab, who are really the drivers of this macrophage, um, let's say, biology and, and new uh, way to, to look at macrophages. And I thank the Paul Ehrlich Stiftung for, um, for the prize, because it's, it's been really supporting the lab and what we do in the lab. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Elvira, for this presentation, which is opening new perspectives for prevention, right? right. Or many new perspectives for prevention, uh, so that we all develop, or not we, but our offspring develops uh, healthier than uh, it was possible uh, to steer it before. Um, I have not more general questions because there are so many specific questions now from the audience sure. that I'd like to ask them. The first one is CD11B is also used to stay in neutrophils. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How did you differentiate macrophage from neutrophils? What is a challenge? Yeah, so in this particular study, we use GR1 to look at pre-macrophages and macrophages. And this is typical, it's a combination of Ly6C and Ly6G. And Ly6G is a, is a neutrophil marker. And this is how we excluded that. So we used some, you call it dump channels, get to get rid of the cells. And this is how we made sure we're not looking at neutrophils. Okay. So um, if uh, somebody uh, in the audience who has asked this question, in this case Susmita Ghosh, uh, has more questions or a follow-up question to this, uh, um, please uh, feel free to do so. But uh, now we'll uh, have the next question, which I cannot see now, but I, I still have it in mind. Um, nanoparticles is one question now, in particular plastic nanoparticles are chemically and topologically very difficult to characterize and validate. How do you correlate the flood of data with your studies on macrophages? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Yes, we do use polystyrene in our case, and these are spheres, and they're fluorescently labeled as a proxy to understand how non-biodegradable plastic may influence immune cells. But this is just the beginning because what, what we need to understand is the corona of the plastic, so what is sitting outside. And will cells take up spherid um, structures or macrophages, will they take them up more easily than, for instance, crystal-like structures? And we are now working together with, with uh, um, someone who is working on environmental plastics to really see what it actually means for, for real. We do need to start somewhere, right? So this is why for now polystyrene is just the beginning and the proxy for the outcome for our immune system. Okay, so you have just started this research program and are very exactly. early on in exactly. your research in this yeah, field. Exactly. Okay. Um, the next question I receive here is uh, macrophages, or you say macrophages, I, I should not say macrophages, right? Macrophages and dendritic cells are very difficult to study as uh, defined cell lines. This includes all the major limitation of donor and donor variations. Can we use your findings to generate genomically and epigenetically well-defined model systems such as Langerhans cells for cell biologists? That's a, a demanding <laughs> I love this question. question. Yeah. I love this question. Thank you so much. Langerhans cells are indeed macrophages and not dendritic cells. It has been, again, due to the ontogeny and where the cells come from, it's a big discussion in the field, but I think we're now convincing more and more people that it's a macrophages. Um, and there are special macrophages because they migrate. Usually ma macrophages don't. Yeah, they just sit there and, you know, scavenge. Um, I think we have the means now, at least for macrophages, to study this in cell systems better because in humans we just take blood, PBMCs, and from monocytes we make macrophages. And then uh, how can we represent this yolk derived system? And we can do this using induced pl pl pluripotent stem cells. So we can make embryo bodies and from that we can now make something that resembles at least tissue resident macrophages. So there we can start to genetically manipulate these cells and look at the outcome. But I think the best would be long term to integrate this into organoids because these cells are really, if they sit alone in a dish, then do ne will never represent um, what they do in a the tissue. 
Okay, thank you very much for this comprehensive answer. I hope uh, it is answered also to the content of uh, the audience, but I'm sure. I thank you very much for answering this question. We are at the end of the Q&A session of your presentation and are uh, free uh, or able to enter now into our first uh, panel discussion on uh, host pathogen alliance and immunity, which is also a very challenging uh, topic to discuss, but I hope uh, we'll uh, find some ways uh, to um, discuss this. Um, I, no, I'll just start. I'll just have to um, rearrange my mind before I, <laughs> before I ask the first question. Um, Bonnie, um, you have obviously gained the foundational knowledge of your field um, through, all, through, through many decades um, under ideal lab conditions, as, as many scientists do. And um, it is interesting to note that um, you are studying quorum sensing as if um, there would be no, um, or it, as if there was no um, immune response by the host. So you have only just begun, I guess, yeah. to integrate immunity into the study of quorum sensing. Yes, that's a fair assessment of my lab's trajectory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think, um, first of all, I need a job. Um, so there better be some more questions to ask. But being serious about it, I think the first, the, you're absolutely right. I think for us, the challenge now, which is kind of what I put in two dimensions on the last slide, is to up the complexity of our experiments. You know, so we shook these bacteria around in a perfect environment in Princeton, New Jersey, in a flask for 20 years. And that was incredibly valuable because we discovered parts and molecules, worm sensing, you know, all these things. And now we have a battery of molecules and reagents and bacteria that can't talk with one language or can't hear out of the other ear. You know, we have all of these resources to bring to bear in scenarios that approximate authentic environments, which is with host cells, with apparently with viruses there too, and host cells. And so now, and in 3D, right, in biofilms that rearrange over time and with flow. Because if we're actually gonna understand how quorum sensing works, and I think this is your question, it works in that yeah. situation. That's the first thing. And second, if we're gonna do something about it, like deploy an anti-quorum sensing therapeutic, it has to be given in a scenario like that as yeah, well, yeah. right? So for both the basic and the applied side of the research, we need to understand it. And we're trying really hard now. Our experiments are all in biofilms. They're in microfluidic chambers. They're under microscopes. There's many organisms present, not just one, but using all of these reagents. And that's a very fun new sort of um, theme yes. for the lab, right, to go to. And then the other, it's the fantasy besides learning the fantasy about that, and I think that DPO molecule starts to get there when we upped it, right, like phages and microbiome bacteria, is that there's all these quorum sensing systems that the bacteria don't bother to use when they're in a flask, right? Like, how do we get that new quorum yeah, sensing yeah. system, you know, after, to your point, 30 years, yeah. right? And it's because, you know, we put these organisms together in these authentic environments. And so I think there's all these cryptic quorum sensing systems that only turn on and off in those kinds of scenarios. So there's two parts. One is how to learn about it in more realistic environments, and the other is to discover new parts and new molecules and new quorum sensing yeah. systems only because you put the bacteria where they actually use those systems. This DPO molecule seems to play an especially important part in the intestinal microbiota, yeah. right? Because here we have these three uh, cell types. We have um, a bacterium which is commensal to, the, um, to, to our gut, uh, which is able to produce DPO. We have the Vibrio cholerae bacteria who can, or which can produce DPO, and we have the phages. And all are somehow in a communication either to defend Vibrio cholerae from the intestinal um, microbiota or from the phage side to, to kill bacteria. So there's a whole uh, huge communication yeah. going on. And, 
and I sometimes, sorry if, if, I, if I pass on the, uh, a question also or, or try to integrate Elvira, um, it seems to be that the microbiota or the microbiome uh, of a mother may influence the development of macrophages also. Is this true? Well, that's a, that's a very good question, and I think there are some discussions about this. So there have, has been a recent study showing that actually maternal microbiome can be found in the fetus. I have doubts that you can really find whole bacteria, but I think that maybe with the core sensing or some metabolites or some parts of bacteria will enter uh, really into the embryo. And there are really nice um, models out now called whiteling mice. So you really give them, you know, worms to eat and something, some pathogens to eat, and you can really follow that. And this is something you really try also to address in the future. Does something that bacteria do in the mom um, really transfer to the developing embryo and thereby can maybe influence uh, macrophage development and make them mature more, make them more functional. Yeah, absolutely. But it is still, as far as I understand you, also controversial whether there is a placental microbiome at all. So exactly. this is not yet... Uh, well, a, there are some sorry. people say there are and some people say there are not. It's like in the macrophage field. Some people say there is an M1 and M2 macrophage and I tell yes. them, no, it, there is not. And then, you know, it, it goes back and forth. Yes. And at some point, maybe in some decades, I we mean, will agree. I mean, this is uh, <laughs> the nature of science that it, uh, it, questions best, have yeah. to be asked. Uh, long time before yeah. uh, you have answers. You know? That's how we get better with time, I guess, yeah. Let us come, uh, if we talk about host pathogen alliance, also to the question, because Robert addressed it in his introduction, of quorum sensing, quorum quenching strategies. Um, how optimistic are you that um, we will be able to realize one of those four um, strategies we could pursue, either to inhibit uh, the synthesis of autoinducers or to uh, inhibit uh, their transmembrane um, trafficking or to uh, degrade them extracellularly or to inhibit uh, the uh, synthesis of uh, receptors. Will this be feasible or is this still um, far away on the horizon? Okay, so I'm brainwashed, right, and think it's going to work great, right? Yeah. So, of course, you know, I have a pony in the race, and I hope that it works great, because it would be an amazing outcome that came from a really obscure, you know, bioluminescent bacterium that started this field. Like, to get there yeah. in 30 years, I don't think is, you know, I think it's kind of cool that we're yeah. there. Yeah, that's but right. Then to so, be, yeah. so, so what I can tell you, so that's my feeling, which you asked, but I'd rather tell you data, which is that for sure in mutants it works. If you make mutant bacteria that can't make the molecules or can't detect the molecules or that you inhibit synthesis of the receptors, they're completely avirulent. And that's in lots of different species. So I think that part seems really solid. So I'll tell you the real fly in the ointment, from my view, is what is the, when, if you went to your physician because you have an infection, you know you're sick, quorum sensing happened, right? It already happened, right? So the question is how long, if we could make a really potent, safe, anti-quorum sensing, you know, therapy, yeah. let's call it that, how long do you have to give it, right? So what we, what the mutants don't tell us, right? They've never communicated, so they're avirulent. But if you have an infection where communication happened, you know, do the bacteria have to chit chat through the whole infection Right? Or could you only use this as a, you know, could you use it as, as a medicine, or is it only a prophylactic? Like you, right? That I think is a real question: is what's the window that such a therapy could work in a, in a not, you know, in a real, not, not just in a mouse or in a test tube? And then the other that we're also thinking about are combinations. You know, maybe if you gave it with a traditional antibiotic that's kind of losing efficacy efficacy, you can kick them in one knee and then kick them in the other knee, yeah. you know, with the anti quorum sensing molecule, and that might actually pump up the efficacy of, yeah. of drugs we already have. So we're sort of thinking about all three of those scenarios, standalone, prophylactic, or combination. And I think there's real evidence that some of that is going to work. But the, the big question is how long do you have to give it? So what are, I mean, um, I, I'm sorry that, that we now focus more on, 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 on you too, because uh, you, ha you have spoken in, in the first uh, session, so to say. Um, you both have 
um, yesterday uh, during the award ceremony expressed um, in different ways how important it was for you to be inspired um, as postdocs, as graduate students by your mentors to develop your field. And we have many young students listening here uh, today, I guess, who wonder in both fields that you are pursuing, both in quorum sensing and in the macrophage development field in this field where immunology and uh, developmental biology meet, what are the hot topics they could enter uh, now? Uh, where could they do their research? Where should they anchor on or anchor in? Yeah, it's, well, there is, it's endless, yeah? Because it's just beginning. The field is really just beginning. And I also see there is a question from, from, from oh, the sorry. audience, why, how yeah. to combine neurology and immunology. I think that's a fantastic field to enter because neuroscientists and immunologists have not been talking at all, yeah? So how yeah. do we solve the problem of neurodegeneration in Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or MS? I think that's something where, you know, it's very strong because there is a lot of funding in both. And I think if you always combine a neuroscientist and immunologist, this will really kind of put you forward. And I think there's a lot of graduate schools you can enter going into that direction maybe that I would definitely uh, try to do. It's very fascinating. Okay. Sorry, I was not aware that there are questions coming in via the screen here. I was so focused on discussing <laughs> with you. Of course. So this was, this was a surprise. But okay, if, if, if it's uh, basically the same question or the same uh, line of question, it's fine. So uh, what would you say? Uh, oh, so I think you already, yeah, I think you gave part of the answer away. Like, I think for, for people that work in bacteria, you know, for 150 years, we've all been shaking them around, you know, in a flask, single species, and usually like laboratory E. coli, not even exotic or wild bacteria, you know, kind of denuded bacteria. So I think the challenge in the, in the bacteria field is complexity, you know, the microbiome, you know, a thousand species, all these different molecules, you know, the hosts, environment, three dimensions, yeah. you know, flow, like trying to really understand how bacteria live not in a flask. Like it's a horizon that never existed before. The tools exist. And so I think if you become a microbiologist today, it's a freaking treasure trove. It's a gold mine of questions, right, to answer that are at a level we never had access to before. You know, yeah. we're not done. A yeah, gold so. mine of questions. Did I understand this right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. A wane of gold, so to say, scientifically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, I have. Sorry. Yes. Can of I course. Ask yes. A yes. Yes. <laughs> certainly. Uh, that's great. If you if you ask a question, okay, I do not want to exclude you. No. I no, actually have a question for you, which is really going to the direction of combining neurology and immunology, because you showed this very cool data about the interaction of microglia and macrophages during the stroke um, context. And I know you know that I'm very clinically orientated. <laughs> so I was wondering, do you have any insights like on, in the direction of the molecular basis, how they're interacting and needing each other? Because this could possibly be cool in terms of brain, brain rearrangement and also therapeutic targeting. Right. So this is what we're trying to address, because we can take the cells now out, because they're fluorescently labeled, right? And we yes. can study what their brain um, transcriptionally and what molecules mm -hmm. they make. And we see that there is um, interference signaling involved. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is also something where people try to, to target monocyte influx. So we, people think sometimes monocytes are the bad guys or monocyte derived macrophages, they're pro-inflammatory, they should not be there, but actually they have to be there to activate the, the resident cells and then they have to go away. So I think really the timing after stroke it's super important to know when did the patient have a stroke, how many days or hours is that a go. Then you may want to stop the influx of immune cells, and then you can the tissue can go back to regeneration. But for instance, for interferon, we now try to address this with different inter interferon um, genes to see whether we can be more precise than just to target the full cell. So there are more questions coming in. I, 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 I would just say one thing, one remark referring to the postdoc question. I just admire, Bonnie, how you uh, support and endorse your postdocs and how you let Justin uh, Wright Silby uh, do this work, which was an, an unusual work to do, 
and gave him or give him the credit for this discovery. Now, I think this is really still unusual today to be so uh, in, in such a solidarity to one's own uh, graduate students and postdocs when they really do the discovery. I, I find this great and I found it also yesterday great how you express the way your lab is working uh, with regard to this uh, over all those years since uh, uh, Mike Silverman said uh, you can put me out of business and uh, now... Yeah. <laughs> and I hope they do it to me. Okay. Yeah. No, I think that's core obsessing, right? Yeah. The group gets more than the individual, right? And so yeah. we, I think if you like this project and you come to my group or work on that, you know, we are really good at sharing and not thinking we're losing something because, you know, the way ideas come from the group and get refined yeah. and whatever. But those were Justin's ideas and Kai's, they weren't mine, right? You know, I helped with spell yeah, check. Yeah, but you, and, you, you let yeah. him go. You yeah, right? absolutely. And, and so, yeah, so you're right. It's necessary. And you said, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, and, and it's complicated to figure yeah, it, out when. It could have been an artifact in a database. Could have been, but said, we would yeah. have figured that out. And so yeah. you're right that the, the being serious, that my job is not to crush their creativity, yeah. right, but to help hone you know, something that really might be cool. And it's hard because you don't know if it's some artifact in the yeah. database yeah, at yeah, first. Yeah. And so you have to, I think, have the guts yeah. to let it play out. But yeah. also, if it's, you know, like I guess what you get when you're older at this is you get this uh, perspective of when they're not going to quite get there and you might be letting them ruin a career. But in both of those cases, it was really clear they kept yeah, getting yeah. closer and closer and closer. And so why stop it? Great. Yeah. I, I think these are experiences you, you also made, right? Um. Definitely. I think, yeah, that, that giving the freedom also for people to kind of go and, and, and go behind their ideas. And this is what I did as well. So I really would appreciate yeah. that being a student. So this is what I'm trying to do for my students and postdocs as well. Katie, for you it was more difficult for some times, right? <laughs> uh, or yes. I was the student, I was the leader, I was by myself. And so yeah. I did what had to be done. And, um, you know, it's a, yeah, actually I was lecturing uh, uh, immuno-oncology and, uh, and uh, neuro-immunology. Neuro For example, I was very much interested. I had colleagues who, you know, we were focusing on uh, neurotrophic factor, you know, because it sounds like it is a good thing, and he went to another uh, place, another job, and now he's inhibiting because that's a pain-related. You don't want that. So yeah. it is, a, you just cannot touch anything in the system because you are creating more problem. And, yeah. But uh, considering that what a young person could uh, start with, it can be anything, you know. Yes. You will know that those people who established molecular biology, they wanted to discover a vitamin. Well, uh, you just need to have the funding, yes, as you can tell from your own. something to do, yeah. you know. When, yeah. I, when I was undergraduate, I, yeah. I went to work with lipids, and everybody were thinking that lipids is so boring, or what, what, what is exciting about? But then I went to the RNA team and then start to make RNA and, you know, I never know that the RNA and the lipid will be one day much closer. Yeah. yeah. There's, uh, this is a good, uh, a good uh, starting point for the last question, which comes from the audience here. Uh, we, have, we have, sorry, we are judging the last question in this first <laughs> panel discussion because we are already beyond our time, but uh, we, we could talk uh, for much longer. Which topic would you develop together if you were trapped in a ski hut for one week? <laughs> I would suggest, you know, identify the enzyme which makes this core, and, uh, you know, make, make, because it must be a protein who's synthesizing, and we could make an RNA, and let's see. You mean the, the, what, what then, makes the core macrophage, a macrophage program? Maybe yeah. the macrophage can do it, but you know, we can do it uh, somewhere else. Uh, I want to mac macrophage do a lot of things. They are very good for RNA. They pick up a particle and they are a great producer. So we, we could have a lot of project immediately. I was just when I was listening, because that's what I did always. When I listened, I said, mm, it would be good for RNA. <laughs> So you would, uh, you would offer RNA or mRNAs to, to produce the tools she needed to pursue her research, right? Yeah, or prove or whatever <coughs> she needed or, or you know, hmm. yeah. 
overexpressed. I know that we are not delivering RNA to <coughs> bacteria, but you know we could deliver to the um, mammalian tissue, and would the, that protein would make the you know the core. We know that protein, core. So I'll take that RNA. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That'd yeah be so what, what a great idea! I mean, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is really a perspective, and I'm sorry to uh, to end it here uh, with a uh, let's say fantasy to. Uh, Paint it out, note. you yeah, know, and, um, but it's a great connection. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. This has been the first session of our uh, symposium. We are um, having a short break now and we'll be back in 15 minutes or so. Thank you to the audience and uh, thank you to the panelists here and to the awardees. It's been great to talk to you and talk with you and we'll continue in 15 minutes. Thanks. <clears throat>
thy word. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Few lines of poetry mirror the secret of successful science better than these famous lines of Robert Frost, and few scientists have lived up to them as consequently as Katalin Kariko, all through the late 80s and 90s, the entire 90s, that stood under the sign of the Human Genome Project, where funds were directed almost exclusively to DNA research, she remained undeterred on her way to explore messenger RNA and really took the road less traveled and uh, remained true to her goal of making messenger RNA available for therapy. Without her research, no messenger RNA vaccine would be available today. Both Moderna and BioNTech rely on your breakthrough paper from 2005 in immunity. Katie, we are glad to have you here and look forward to your presentation about your way on the road less traveled. Thank you very much. I am also very happy to be here. And of course, you know, not me, but hundreds and thousands of scientists contributed to, to develop that vaccine because it started 60 years ago. And today I try to, in 20 minutes, tell the story of that 60 years. <laughs> uh, although at the beginning I was not uh, there in 61, I couldn't even read in Hungarian, but. But uh, the rest of it I remember quite well, how it happened and what happened during this uh, 60 years uh, coming from discovering the RNA and uh, isolating RNA. People made experiments and synthesized in vitro was discovered. It. And then a lot of, lot of optimizing because the major problem was always with the RNA. It was not good enough. So it started, as I mentioned, in 61, and with this uh, discovery of mRNA, we learned that uh, the information flow from DNA, RNA, to protein. And of course, the scientists could not uh, uh, synthesize at that point RNA, so that we have to wait with the RNA therapy. But what they did, uh, they started to analyze that, how this RNA looked. And in 1975, they discovered that very important structural element, the cap. And it was already in 75 identified that uh, uh, eukaryotic RNA has cap. And then when they removed the cap, the translation did not proceed. And in the same year, 75 identified enzymes, which is uh, doing that. Other scientists were interested to isolate the RNA from the cell because they didn't know how to do it. They did a lot of effort, and we can find that they use bacterial enzyme and others, but. At that point, they just could isolate RNA, and they isolated from uh, reticulocytes because it was enriched with uh, uh, globin uh, mRNA. And when they separated in the early time, they just translated in cell lysate. Later on, they injected in a uh, uh, frog oocyte because those are large, ce large cells and easy to inject. And uh, for me, the very important experiment was when they enveloped it into liposome and we are talking about 1978 here. Actually, liposome was uh, discovered in, and used in, in the mid-60s. And uh, they put the RNA in it, this isolated RNA, and fused to primary mammalian cells. And they could, all of these experiments, they could detect that the RNA, which was delivered from outside to the mammalian cell, this was translated, and they could detect it. I was, we were reading this paper, actually, and. What uh, happened is that um, we did not isolate the RNA, we did a plasmid. And actually, we did this in the end of the uh, uh, 70s, and we did a liposome entropy DNA, and we delivered plasmid DNA to the mammalian cells. I'm just saying this because I was a student and just had to make my hands wet and start somewhere. 
And that influenced all, you know, the uh, rest of my life because I, so many times I thought back on those experiments. So we delivered uh, this uh, uh, plasmid with liposome. But uh, scientists uh, proceeded, and in 1984, they figured out how to synthesize the RNA. This was very critical, because up until that, everything was just beta globin. Now that uh, cloning and all of the molecular biology ex uh, uh, ex uh, excelled, and, uh, and uh, Doug Melton and Paul Krieg at uh, Harvard University, they selected uh, phage polymerase. First, SP6 polymerase, RNA polymerase, then T7 RNA polymerase. They demonstrated that in vitro you can generate an RNA which has all of this characteristic. They kept the RNA, there is a cap structure, the UTR, the untranslated region, and the coding sequence. And that the RNA they injected to frog oocyte. We are still in the 80s, and you know, actually the mammalian cell culturing was not uh, uh, at that time was so uh, accessible. So after injection, they cultured this injected frog oocyte, and they demonstrated that the secreted human interferon was functional. It inhibited uh, uh, viral proliferation. So this uh, was um, started that people started to uh, uh, making RNA and then using uh, delivering in vivo. It is uh, usually the one paper per year, so it was easy to follow. Not like in these days that every hour or you know coming out an RNA mRNA related paper and the scientists try to use it for for therapeutic purpose like you know when um, uh, overexpressing uh, vasopressin mRNA they try to use as vaccine like infectious disease vaccine 93 94 those papers were influenza vaccine mRNA based and uh, and then uh, later on most of the study was focusing of cancer vaccine and the uh, infectious disease uh, vaccine uh, mRNA is not too many people tried even later on. So why it was happening, you know, people, all of the scientists struggle with something, that the RNA was not good enough. Why it was, is was when they delivered, whether it is an animal or in cells, you know, they degraded so quickly, very small amount of protein was made and it was not sufficient. And when they tried to inject more, then it was inflammatory. And so there are a lot, lot improvement need, needed to be done. So these were the major challenges, not enough. And that's why many people thought that it will never be a therapy. So what I was doing meantime in the um, end of the 90s is that um, joined in a laboratory and um, first in cardiology and then later in uh, neurosurgery because like in molecular biology can be anything. And um, we started to deliver mRNA coding for molecules, which we, um, uh, this mRNA coding for, whether it is a protein which we wanted to use for um, inhibiting uh, coagulation or whether uh, inhibiting uh, vasoconstriction and so on. And meanwhile, we constantly improve the mRNA performance. And um, uh, what happened is that um, I did not realize actually that the RNA was immunogenic until I met uh, Drew Weissman and uh, who demonstrated that uh, it was uh, uh, inflammatory cytokines were induced the RNA I made. I thought that the RNA I am making is the same as inside the cell. But uh, to figure out whether even the cell, we inside our cell, the mRNA is also inflammatory, just because it is coming from outside and normally it should be inside. So uh, we isolated the RNA from different compartments. And in the purple, you can see the RNA I am making, you know, this was very high level of TNF alpha was induced. And those which we isolated from the mammalian cells in blue uh, graph, you know, that you can see is not really that much inflammatory, although they are also. But importantly, the tRNA there is not, was not inflammatory. And that gave the idea that maybe, because tRNA has so many different uh, uh, modifications, maybe the nucleoside modification could be the reason why they are not causing inflammation. And to uh, uh, 
identified that really this is the case, we did generate the nucleoside modified mRNA by in vitro transcription on a way that nature is not doing because we all making the, our mRNA from the four basic nucleotides and post transcriptionally we modify that with different enzymes. But here we already uh, used the nucleoside modified triphosphates and, um, and incorporated. And what we tested out on isolated primary cells, uh, dendritic cells, and what we found is that. Uh, we did not get any TNF alpha uh, induction when the uridine was modified. Who knew that, that the uridine was so critical? And when it was uh, modified uridine, then it was, uh, doesn't matter whether it was pseudouridine, 5-methyl uridine, or tetraiouridine, it was not inflammatory, it didn't induce uh, any TNF alpha. And luckily, at least, uh, uh, two of them translated, and pseudouridine containing RNA translated 10 times better. We spent uh, two years understanding why the pseudouridine containing mRNA translates so well. At that point, we didn't know at all that uh, whether uh, our normal mammalian or human mRNA has pseudouridine. Today, we know that we also have it. What was important that we could translate. And then we needed further improvement, and one was, you know, that we had to purify. So that's what, you, if you look at from the 60 years, I mean, at least 30 years is starting with improving the translation, purifying, structural element changing, and, you know, incremental changing uh, resulted that we get better translation. And this was showing here that. Um, the RNA, when it was uh, uh, purified, then it was not in using all of the cytokines showing in this map in the middle. And then, as a result of the translation, we get um, better, uh, better translation when we purify these RNAs. So again, this is the story of the mRNA therapy to improve the translation. And, uh, we have uh, uh, made a pseudouridine containing RNA, and we want to see that whether in vivo is working, whether it is not immunogenic. And uh, in the red line, you can see that erythropoietin coding RNA, when it was pseudouridine injecting 0.1 microgram in a mice, you know, we could four days, we could measure the uh, translated protein in their blood, whereas uh, the half-life was just, you know, two hours or six hours. And it was functional. In the middle panel shows that it was hematocrit was increased, the erythropoietin uh, differentiate her red blood cells. And in the right panel shows that it was, this uh, uh, was not inducing uh, interferon. Why I was doing this in the other side of the pond, you know, in uh, Philadelphia, Ugur Zahin was, and uh, Tureci, it's, um, Islam was doing uh, here, again, optimizing the RNA. They changed different structural elements. The cap uh, was improved because changing the cap uh, with a different analog, different uh, other uh, untranslational sequences were changed. And as a result of it, you know, the efficiency is exponentially, the translational efficiency trans increased. They did a lot of experiment in animals also. And uh, they discovered that intranodally injecting mRNA is taken up by uh, dendritic cells there. And, um, and this is uh, what the first uh, human trial started the vaccine. They showed that when it was, uh, uh, the, it was taken up, injected the RNA into the lymph node, it was taken up the mRNA and translated in the dendritic cells. And this is what you need to have a vaccine. So in their mind and their focus was vaccine, cancer vaccine, I was focusing on th therapeutic uh, protein coding, RNA. And of course, that was why it was critical to get non-inflammatory. Whereas at the beginning, we thought that, you know, maybe it is beneficial for certain vaccine that the RNA is uh, immunogenic. So uh, Ugur and Islam and the BioNTech, you know, this proceeded and clinical trial started with patient and that was actually the reason why I came to uh, BioNTech because there are already clinical trial was ongoing and I thought that uh, modified RNA is the best place if I come. And patients responded very well when they were vaccinated and here is the uh, 
individualized cancer vaccine when it was tested out on melanoma patient. They uh, did, you know, just three relapses, and most of the people did not relapse after they get the vaccine. So another thing what uh, uh, BioNTech, Ugur, and Özlem was doing is that uh, they developed formulation because, you know, you had to protect the RNA from degradation and and uh, demonstrated, uh, uh, and this uh, actually this first lipid uh, formulation that uh, they also used in human trial and uh, by BioNTech. So what happened is that as a result of uh, work, what I was doing at the University of Pennsylvania and Ugur and his colleagues were doing here, now that this uh, standard RNA now became optimized RNA and you, we get a lot of uh, translation high level. and. Uh, so what we were doing, so I, I joined BioNTech, and here we are, 2013, we immediately started to write a big review about, you know, that what everybody should know about mRNA therapy, regulatory and uh, uh, other technical. And as in the story I mentioned, the improvement of translation was constantly there and the delivery. So we also did a lot of uh, improvement. One of them was when we introduced the CAP1 in the 5 prime end and uh, logarithmically increased the translation, extended the translation. And now we know why, because, uh, you know, initiation uh, uh, factor 4E could bind to the CAP1 and inhibit IFIT1, which is the interferon-induced tetraticle which can block uh, translation of the CAP0 RNA. What we have uh, done also, that uh, although we did a purification at the uh, at University of Pennsylvania with the uh, HPLC, but here we needed something which is scalable, and that was this uh, cellulose uh, purification. Because uh, during the transcription, we always have um, single-stranded and double-stranded RNA. Double-stranded RNA contaminant is uh, as aberrant product uh, generated during transcription. And then we worked out a procedure that uh, very easily scalable manner. And uh, the RNA was um, not, uh, 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 not uh, containing double-stranded RNA, translated better. And, uh, in addition, we started to use, now that we have the cap one, we have the purification, everything is, seems nice. Of course, we can always further improve, but um, we started to use it here. I'm showing when we generated uh, by specific antibody encoding RNA, why is important? Because this uh, protein half-life is two hours and very quickly degrade and would need it. Uh, to use RNA because the RNA would be continuously for a couple of days would translate. And we generated and showed that uh, even large tumors could be eliminated from mice. The other studies we have actually published last year, what uh, the first project I worked on, this is again nucleoside modified RNA, just like for the uh, bispecific antibody, one methyl pseudouridine containing RNA, and um, we injected intratumorally. And um, these um, uh, making the cold to more hot, and these RNA were coding for four cytokines. And um, what happened is that uh, it could uh, eradicate, eliminate uh, the metastatic uh, uh, tumors from the lung of the animals. And uh, you can see there the clinical trial, uh, you can find it's ongoing with uh, uh, Sanofi. And these patients were injected, and then uh, we will see that whether they're um, uh, remotely located tumors will be uh, eliminated. And uh, we did a, a tolerization, and this was uh, again last year we published, so that not just we can vaccinate and induce immune response against uh, unwanted uh, like cancer or, or uh, uh, infectious disease uh, viruses, but we can also induce tolerization. And we uh, demonstrated that nucleoside modified RNA, now delivered with the selected uh, lipids, which is not activating the immune system, repeated uh, injection of the animals could uh, induce tolerization in animal model of uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, different model of multiple sclerosis. And we identified also the mechanism and uh, what we published last year. And uh, uh, finally, that uh, we have done this study, which maybe many of you know 
so much better because in the television, we could hear daily that where is, what is going on, what happened to the uh, vaccine trial, and, um, and many of us, uh, uh, you know, received just like myself, the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine. And uh, what I want to tell you that all of these, you know, 60 years of work, of course, the last uh, 20, 30 years when Ugur, Uslan, BioNTech, I was working on it was very intense. And, um, and getting closer and closer, you know, to, to the human uh, application and then uh, uh, providing uh, evidence that it, uh, it worked and uh, it is very effective. And this is how the first mRNA, <clears throat> and I might say even the first RNA, because the siRNA is not really RNA, they are two fluoro, you know, two prime fluoro is not really RNA, so this is not just the first mRNA, the, the first RNA product which became FDA approved. And with that, I would just like to say many of my colleagues and many of those people who I just referenced and put the paper there so students can read if they are interested because all, all of them contributed to the success of the vaccine and this whole platform of messenger RNA therapy. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Katie, for this uh, fast run through the history of mRNA development. It was a great presentation, but I think you were far too modest uh, in uh, explaining your own role, because what you did uh, to uh, prove that uridine modification was essential to overcome mm -hmm. immunity was an almost single-handed work in the lab for several years. Wouldn't Drew Weissmann have supported you financially, I guess, this wouldn't have been achievable. And you once told me that on the uh, paper, one of the people, or, or some of the people are the lab technicians, because uh, um, uh, you yeah. mainly did this all on your own for, for those many years, which has been published in Immunity then. So this mm -hmm. was a really great, great uh, achievement, and, 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 and uh, it was a kind of an endurance also uh, you showed, uh, perhaps a bit like your daughter who won two times the gold medal in uh, rowing in 2008 and 2012. So uh, uh, you, you really had this passion to, to persevere and to stay on board, uh, and, and, and so I think uh, you need not to be so yeah. modest when yeah, but presenting you, this. You are mentioning the rowing. I, yeah. Many times I mentioned that, you know, our science is so similar, you know. Yeah. Uh, because uh, the rowers is not seeing the finish line. We didn't see. You know, yeah. we are just pulling like crazy, you know, doing the experiment because we believing that there is a finish line. Yeah. And then when we reach the finish line, we start another race. And, and of course, we don't, as a scientist, many times we don't even know that we are going to the right direction. <laughs> but, yes. <laughs> But your, yeah. I mean, your, your initial um, um, intention was to develop protein replacement therapies, yes. right, in the 90s. And, and you are also now vice president at BioNTech for protein re replacement mm -hmm. therapies. Um, is this amount of efficiency, of improved uh, translational efficiency enough already for protein replacement therapy? Or is it now just, let's say, sufficient for antigen uh, production for uh, vaccine development. How do you envision the development here? The intratumoral injection of the mRNA coding for cytokines is, is not vaccine, it's not antigen coding. The RNA codes for cytokines, so making the cold tumor hot. So those are already replacement. The replacement means that uh, uh. I alway, always thought about that I will use the RNA to um, express a protein which is not enough, not in the right place and not enough. So uh, that's why I was never worried about, uh, uh, you know, immunology or some kind of inflammation, and in because I thought that I just, uh, you know, overexpressed something which, uh, which is, uh, you know, not enough. And then those cytokines, if those cytokines present in the tumor, the, those are melanoma and head and neck cancer tumor, and then they already metastase to the lung and other part of the body. So you can teach 
those, so the immune cells will run to this uh, tumor, yes. and then when they circulate, they will eliminate. This is but, uh, but your original intention was in cystic fibrosis, for example, to build the ion channel uh, to, to integrate from an intracellular production into the membrane uh, to substitute uh, yeah. um, this uh, defect. So, so the main reason was because that's what I, how I could get a grant, yeah. was, was a RFA, and then I read all of the paper which was published on that, and then I uh, wanted to and even today, I am thinking, but now a different approach than I had that time. So, okay. you know, the cystic fibrosis is still there, and, um, but not, uh, not the epithelia. I want to overexpress that protein. But, uh, uh, you know, many of the things which we were doing is secretable product. Because in that case, you can reach any cells, and they yeah. secrete and then circulate, like the erythropoietin. You know, is, we didn't put to the RNA to the kidney. It does not depend from the size or on the size of the protein. So it, it, it's no, no matter whether it's 14, uh, 1,400 amino acids or just uh, um, 200 or so. Yeah, yeah, that's, okay. uh, you know, any... But then but, this but, was what, a misunderstanding from my side. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I tried, <coughs> of course, it was correct. You know, hmm. I, I mean, I made... Mm, 93, I was uh, several grant I submitted for cystic fibrosis using circular RNA, which is again very popular. Hmm. And um, so I tried to, uh, you know, do, use this kind of stabilization that, you know, there will be no end on the RNA. Because at that time I was not aware that there are enzymes, you know, in the endosome which were cut into Am the Amazingly, RNA. there is just one question here on the screen which I haven't seen before. Can you give us brief insights into your work on CFDR, which is cystic fibrosis, <laughs> of course? The the most deadly inherited uh, disease it would be an ideal target for mRNA based therapy. Yes, um, yes. so uh, you know one, one approach is that to deliver the mRNA in the macrophage in, t in the lung because uh, actually uh, most of the bacteria which taken up, macrophage is taking up the bacteria, the uh, uh, pseudomonas and the uh, Staphylococcus aureus, and they can still proliferate inside the <coughs> bacteria because uh, the, they use chlorine to lower their pH, but they cannot lower their pH because the uh, channel protein is missing. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, maybe we have to deliver to the macrophages. And, yeah. And many other, other uh, ideas, you know, I had. So, so your field is flourishing, the protein replacement therapy field also. Yeah, yeah I, I, I had a lot of ideas and I am so glad that companies are made on, based on, and they are doing, and I am very excited that whether it would be, you know, would be successful, because oh. I've thought about the same thing, but, you know, I don't have enough time. And, you know, just like you are thinking, you know, let's other people try. I have another question here from the audience. Liquid phase segregation of RNA is a hot topic. Can this liquid phase segregation help to improve the antigenicity of the target proteins, example given tumor associated antigens, viral antigens? What is the potential advantage of antigen compartmentalization for so called? cross-presentation in dendritic cells. Any other question? <laughs> Pardon? I, 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 don't, I don't know this. Okay, uh, this is a, a good compartmentalization. answer. Compartmentalization so, yeah, was okay. very specific. So um, I, I, I just, <clears throat> I'm also not familiar with this question. I have to admit, yeah. I just mm -hmm. read it here from the screen yeah, because yeah. it obviously came uh, okay. from the audience. So I'm, uh, I have to give a, a sorry to the audience. We are clueless, yeah. but it's a good question. So. Um, and the next one would be, and the last one in this uh, Q&A session here is, RNA is used in interference RNA technology. I mean, it's in, in RNA uh, I technology systemically, such as in C. allergens and planter. Can we imagine that mRNA can be administered, administered to mammalian cells via specific transport mechanisms to be even much more effective. But we have the nanolipids, right? Are they not effective? I mean, yeah, exosomes already, we know that uh, yeah. it is a similar system. So exosomes exist, and then they contain RNA, and that's uh, circulating and going to another cell. Yeah. And it's taken up and then translating. So there, there is a transport. 
And this in is effective enough, so there is no need for, for other more effective transport mechanisms right now. Um, yeah, and, uh, and uh, actually there are companies, you know, who are <coughs> using uh, exosome and l loading them with uh, um, in vitro transcribed RNA, or they are generating certain cell types that will have a very high level of certain type of RNA inside, the, uh, and which is loaded uh, in, inside the cell. Now I have a, um, an empty screen, no, no more questions. <laughs> All have been deleted, there have had been some questions. Okay. So yep. thank you very much, thank Katie, you. for your presentation you. and for this discussion. Thank you. <coughs> I, um, I forgot to say one thing, uh, I, I apologize. Uh, we ask you please send your questions perhaps already during the presentation because we are witnessing some delay here in the arrival of your email questions. Uh, so please feel free to send them now uh, during this presentation already uh, during this presentation. So, and last but not least, you will now be listening to Dr. Laura Hinze. She is a medical doctor caring for children who suffer from cancer. When she was 14 years old, during an internship at an oncological station, she met and she got acquainted to Arthur, a patient of the same age who was doomed to die, but never gave up the hope for a cure and his will to live. From this encounter stems her desire to both practice medicine and propel it forward by cutting edge research and she succeeded. Not only do her results suggest novel approaches to break the resistance of leukemia cells against the standard chemotherapy, they also open up or may open up new horizons for solid tumors such as colorectal cancers. Laura, please, the screen is yours. Thank you very much for this lovely introduction. It's my pleasure and of course also great honor to give the last talk of this gorgeous symposium today and I would actually like to start with a brief overview about my today's talk. So I of course will spend a few words on our findings of the past years concerning the role of regulated protein degradation in mediating drug response and resistance in cancer cells. But in the second half of my talk, I also would like to elaborate a little bit more on better understanding mechanisms of amino acid sensing in cancer cells and also how to potentially um, devise therapeutic interventions from there. And of course, I would like to finish with a quick outlook for the future. Let me start by saying a few words about my background and motivation. I know my co-laureates already do know about it because we had the chance of spending a few very nice days here together in Frankfurt, but for you as a virtual audience today, um, what we are really interested in is to better understand the molecular basis of treatment resistance in cancer cells and how to devise therapeutic interventions. And we are primarily focusing on better understanding how cancer cells can actually survive a starvation from amino acids whose availability is usually absolutely crucial for cancer cell for survival and cancer cell proliferation. And especially in asparagine, depletion is lethal to some cancer cells, which in a clinical context is exploited therapeutically by the use of the bacterial enzyme asparaginase. And asparaginase is an integral component in the current standard treatment protocols for um, acute lymphoblastic leukemias. And when you compare the mechanism of action of asparaginase to other commonly used chemotherapeutic agents, it's quite unique in terms of the mechanism of action because what asparaginase usually does it depletes in the extracellular as well as intracellular compartment the non-essential amino acid asparagine, which at least in sensitive cells leads to subsequent leukemic cell death. However, the development of resistance towards asparaginase-based treatment regimens is a major clinical obstacle. And years back when we started to work in that field, we first tried and, and set out to define how actually this resistance develops and how this occurs in patients. And we found out that resistant leukemia cells rely on an adaptive pathway which is mediated by proteasomal degradation to basically replenish the pool of free amino acids to then survive an asparagine depletion. And this whole proteasomal degradation machinery is mediated by the key kinase GSK3 which leads to a protein phosphorylation and then subsequently also to a ubiquitination and proteasomal degradation. And of note, by inhibiting this GSK3 activity, either by activating wind signaling 
or by the use of a GSK3 inhibitor, we are able to block this adaptive pathway and then also blocking the pool of free amino acids in order to survive an asparagine depletion. And this whole pathway that I'm talking about here in terms of blocking the proteasomal degradation machinery leads to the effect of protein stabilization because you can imagine if proteins are not breaking down anymore, they of course start to be stabilized and they start to accumulate in a cell. And this is referred to be wind dependent stabilization of proteins or the short form is wind stop. So um, wind stop activation and thus inhibiting proteasomal degradation in these cells is creating a unique vulnerability in cancer cells which can, exploited, be, th can be exploited therapeutically by the use of GSK3 inhibitors. However, when you're thinking about wind signaling and especially um, beta catenin and independent branches, what you're not necessarily thinking about in the first place is an acute leukemia, but what comes up quite quickly is um, colorectal cancers because it's a classical wind-driven disease. So we wanted to know whether we can actually exploit the interference of GSK3 inhibition, also asperidine depletion, in a different and unrelated cancer entity. And translationally, this is also of relevance because patients with a high metastatic burden, they still have a very dismal prognosis. In the past years and also decades, there has been a lot of work that has been done to, to better define and characterize the genetic landscape of colorectal cancers. And what we do know so far is that roughly 85% of patients harbor mutations downstream of GSK3 and are thus only affecting the beta catenin branch of wind signaling. However, there are also 15% of patients that harbor mutations upstream of GSK3, and mostly they are our spawn infusion proteins, and they are leading to an intrinsic inhibition of GSK3 and are thus affecting the beta catenin as well as the wind stop branch. So just by looking at this little schematic diagram on the right side, you can see that actually colorectal cancers are providing a unique experimental setting to test our hypotheses derived from leukemias because on the one side we have a wind stop off status, which is reflected by APC mutations, and on the other side we have wind stop on status, which is reflected by our spawn infusion proteins, for example, because they have an intrinsic GSK3 inhibition. So we, in, in doing our time of doing the studies, we turned to an in vivo model and we first used an R-spawn infusion protein tumor model in mice. And we can clearly see, depicted by the blue line, that an asparaginase monotherapy in this wind stop on condition led to a very significant delay in tumor progression, especially R-spawn infusion protein tumors. They, in, a, in a human, they are really associated with a rapid disease progression, also a high metastatic burden. And similarly, looking at an APC mutated context, having a combination of a GSK3 inhibitor plus asparaginase, again depicted in the blue line, um, you can see a very similar phenotype with a significant delay in tumor progression. And just by visually looking at these mice, it becomes quite visible that in the combinated treated mice, there is no visible tumor anymore. So this is currently providing the rationale for testing, especially in asparaginase monotherapy in the context of r spawn infusion protein positive colorectal cancer cells. But while we were doing these studies, there was another very interesting observation that we had, which was attracting our attention, because the response and resistance towards an asparagine depletion seems to be uniquely dependent on GSK3 alpha activity, and not on its closely rated paralog GSK3 beta. And this is biologically interesting, but also translationally, because translationally, of course, when you're inhibiting both GSK3 paralox alpha and beta at the same time, you have the problem also affecting beta ketinin and thus having oncogenic side effects, which we, of course, want to avoid if we're thinking about therapeutic avenues. But having the option of only targeting GSK3 alpha, we are avoiding the activation of beta ketinin and can only interfere with the wind stop and amino acid deprivation response. And biologically, this is very interesting because alpha and beta are actually thought to be redundant for most of their biologic functions, and they are also displaying a very high sequence homology of greater than 95%. So we were quite interested in further studying that, and we found out when we applied structural prediction algorithms that GSK3 alpha is harboring an N-terminal low complexity domain, which is totally missing in GSK3 beta. So especially these low complexity domains in the past years have been associated with phase separation or spatial sequestration of proteins, which basically represents a cellular mechanism to assemble all components of important biochemical reactions and membraneless organelles to then promote catalysis of certain important biochemical processes. 
So one of our hypotheses was that maybe this GSKT alpha N terminal low complexity domain could drive such a spatial sequestration as an amino acid starvation response in cancer cells. And indeed, when we leveraged immunofluorescence confocal microscopy, we found that in response to an aspirate gene depletion, there is a translocation of GSK3-alpha into these distinct cytoplasmic bodies, which we cannot observe for GSK3-beta. And so there are known phase separate compartments. And one of our very obvious questions was, of course, are they co-localizing? Are they represented and reflected by the already known phase separated compartments? However, they did not. So this was, of course, also interesting to us to better understand the biologic basis of this phase separate compartment, which we subsequently call GSKT alpha bodies. And as we are talking a lot about the context of proteosomal degradation machinery and ubiquitination of proteins, we were wondering whether this might reflect a cellular response to actually assemble and concentrate all important components of these um, proteosomal degradation machinery. And indeed, so we found evidence that these GSKT alpha bodies are co-localizing with proteosomal subunits, but also with ubiquitin, which is here representatively depicted. And when we quantify this in, in more cells, we can see that most of the bodies that are forming for GSKT alpha as well as for ubiquitin are actually co-localizing. So this seems to be a cellular response to assemble the proteosomal degradation machinery parts to actually then allow for efficient protein breakdown in response to an amino acid starvation. And intriguingly, we cannot only see this in response to a selective asparagine depletion, but also in response to a selective depletion of two other essential amino acids, including leucine and valine, which is, of course, quite interesting. And this is currently leading to our working model, which is that GSK3-alpha assembles in this spatial sequestration um, membraneless organelles, basically, together with the ubiquitin ligases with the proteasomal subunits. And we also do know that the heat shock proteins play an important role in that context. And in selective depletion of leucine, asparagine, or valine, this can trigger a cellular response to survive actually this amino acid starvation response. And translationally, this is very interesting to us because um, when we look at leukemia patient-derived samples and we classify them in high-risk and low-risk leukemias, um, we can see that um, basically the GSKT alpha body formation is a predicting response and resistance towards asparaginase-based treatment regimen. So we are currently expanding our cohort size to see if this is actually a possible biomarker for clinical translation. So I just talked about our model, and this is, of course, raising several questions that we are currently really interested in and further elucidating. And so this is still, of course, focusing into the role of regulating uh, protein degradation, also better understanding how actually spatial sequestration of GSKT alpha is mediated in cancer cells. And I've been talking a lot about wind stop signaling in the past minutes of my talk, but when you look at the literature, there is not much known about how this pathway is actually regulated. There are some data in normal cells, especially with regards to meiosis and mitosis. So what we are currently doing is we are performing a genome-wide screen and wind stop on versus wind stop off conditions to actually identify such candidates that are regulating that pathway. And just recently, we found out that apparently um, there is also another pathway involved in this amino acid starvation response, which is called N-Degron pathway, or formerly known as an n -Eng rule pathway, which is based on the N-terminal recognance, then leading to a proteasomal breakdown in response to an amino acid starvation. And we're really trying to investigate how this is relating to each other. Another interesting part is, of course, that a particular depletion of leucine, asparagine, and valine can drive spatial sequestration. And this is already implying that the cancer cells now somehow must realize how much the level of these three particular amino acids is. And it's just basically representing that there must be a mammalian sensor for these amino acids. And there is one known sensor for leucine, but not for asparagine and valine. So this is, was attracting our attention, and we found out that there is a protein, which is called prune, which in selective depletion of asparagine, valine, and leucine binds to GSKT-alpha. And even more intriguingly, it can also directly bind these amino acids without directly binding to the physiochemically similar amino acids, including lutamine and isoleucine. And I actually need to admit that when we, by chance, bumped into Prune as a binding partner of GSKT alpha, I needed to look it up myself because Prune didn't tell me anything, to be honest. And Prune is a phosphodiesterase. It's not very well known also. But the very compelling thing about Prune is it's the only known mammalian exopolyphosphatase. 
and especially exopolyphosphatase in yeast are associated with the breakdown of polyphosphates as an alternative source of energy. And so currently, as we are talking about the context of an amino acid starvation response, it's very interesting to see how prune is actually relating to this and how this is driving spatial sequestration of GSKT alpha. Um, so yeah, I've been talking a lot about the metabolic side of things and what is interesting also in the context of spatial sequestration is that there are certain motifs that have been associated with the spatial sequestration of proteins and usually they are thought to be arginine, tyrosine and glutamine enriched but when you're taking a close look at the N-terminal region of GSKT alpha you'll quite easily see that there is a very glycine and serine rich region and such a motif has never been associated with phase separation before. So right now we are trying to identify the motif and the, re the repeated motif sequence that is mediating liquid-liquid phase separation, also the molecular determinants that are driving this biological process. And of course we are therefore using our in vitro studies, but we are also trying to set up, set up an in vivo PDX model where we are basically using leukemia and patient derived samples where we knock out GSKT alpha by CRISPR and then we are re-expressing different versions of the GSKT alpha and terminal region to really see in vivo in a leukemia setting which motif is driving um, phase separation reflected by the response to an amino acid starvation in terms of survival. So I've been talking a lot about the cancer side of things, but of course what is also interesting to further investigate and elucidate on is um, the context of normal cells and there is no evidence that actually GSKT alpha can also regulate this in normal cells and this is what we are really interested in to further understand this in hematopathic stem cells. And therefore we set up a mouse model which we call GSKT alpha delta N mouse model. And what we did is we basically replaced the GSKT alpha N terminus, which is encoded by exon 1 and exon 2, by the GSKT beta N terminus, which is also encoded by exon 1 and exon 2. So we are basically expressing a GSKT alpha in mice, which has a genetically blocked phase separation because we replaced the N terminus. And what we're trying to better understand is how this relates in the context of an amino acid starvation response to um, the homing ability of cancer cells, the self-renewal capacity, and also the differentiation of progenitor cells. And lastly, and with this, I'm already coming to my end of my presentation. I mean, we are always interested in also devising therapeutic interventions and having identified the N-terminal low complexity domain of GSKT alpha as a basis of treatment resistance. This is, of course, also providing a strategy for therapeutic intervention. And therefore, we are utilizing a DNA encoded library where we are looking for small molecule compounds that are particularly binding to the GSKT alpha N terminus without binding to the GSKT beta N terminus. And so we are trying to identify small molecule compounds in vitro as well as in vivo that could have therapeutic potential here. And with this, I would like to summarize with a quick outlook. So we are really trying to better understand the molecular mechanisms of WinStop and associated protein degradation machinery pathways and how this relates to the cellular amino acid starvation response. We are trying to better understand how cancer cells can sense amino acid levels and how this regulates spatial sequestration, particularly of GSKT alpha, not only in cancer cells, but also normal cells. And finally, by utilizing especially a DNA encoded library scheme to, to, to look for interference with the GSKT alpha and terminal low complexity domain, we are trying to devise novel therapeutic interventions. And with this, I would like to first of all thank my lab actually doing all the work behind this, all our collaborators and of course also funders. And I'm very happy to answer the questions. I'm looking forward very much to our panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Laura, for this very deep insight into uh, the complicated, um, le let's say, uh, metabolism of uh, amino acids in a cancer cell. It was a great presentation. My first question is, um, GS there are almost no um, metabolic pathways um, in organisms where GSK doesn't play a role. GSK is, a, is an enzyme that is almost ubiquitous. Uh, GSK alpha in this form certainly not, but even then um, it is obviously a master regulator here in protein and amino acid metabolism. How dangerous might it be or how likely that cells develop relatively quickly resistance 
and find uh, redundant pathways um, to uh, GSK3 alpha inhibition? I think there's a very high likelihood because this is what we actually also see in our models. So we, as, you, <coughs> as I just said, we are working with leukemias as well as with colorectal cancers and you always have the clotal heterogeneity. And leukemia cells readapt more quickly than colorectal cancers. And this is what we actually see that we have several leukemia clones and some of them are resistant to WinStop and some of them are sensitive, which is not that much the case for colorectal cancers. So I think that cancer cells are actually smart enough to escape that mechanism also. So we are really trying this. It's the reason why I also pointed at the screen where we want to identify regulators of that pathway because we actually don't know exactly what the molecular basis is and then how cancer cells actually can, yes. can escape. So um, there's another question from the audience which I, uh, which I um, would ask now. Peptides are very instable to therapy, peptides. How do you cope with this limitation? Uh, peptides in terms of um, small molecule compound screen or uh, I, because I, I think the only part I could think about peptides right now is in the context of small molecule compound yeah. screening that I just talked about. Um, so <coughs> I think this is just in order to get a clue what is actually interfering with the N-terminus because right now we don't know anything and just it's one step towards the direction of more development but yeah. of course this is a downside. But, uh, nevertheless, I, am I right that you are more or less targeting the wind signaling pathway in a hitherto unknown way and um, that uh, you are looking to stop the degradation of beta catenin um, so that there is no asparaginase source for leukemia cells to get it from beta catenin degradation. No, so what we're looking at is a beta catenin independent branch. So WinStop is really more a global phenomenon. It's like really global protein degradation. It's not just about beta catenin. It's really unrelated. So, so WinStop basically affects a broad range of proteins in a cell. And, you know, this is just a regular protein degradation okay. machine. Okay, so that is you, you, you stabilize a lot of different proteins exactly. in order to um, stop... Um, asparaginase, uh, uh, giving asparaginase to leukemia cells. So in my English is worsening the later the evening gets. I, I totally feel your pain, it's okay. <laughs> it's, okay. it's been a sharp night also for me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's actually summarizing it because um, you can imagine that uh, in order to replenish the pool of amino acids, you need a lot of protein breakdown. So you need a global phenotype in your cell that you're looking at. And uh, <coughs> so if asparaginase is coming and it is depleting asparagine and you have an alternative source, it's of course coming from a lot of proteins and not just from beta catenin. So okay. this is affecting Good. the whole part. Got it, yeah. yeah, thank you. What is known about the supramolecular organization of GSK? Alpha. <laughs> well, not so much, honestly. So uh, that's uh, what we are interested in because when we discovered that there is a distinct um, cytoplasmic translocation, we were wondering whether this is reflecting the known phase separate compartments because this is, of course, what you first of all think about. But then we realized that this is not the case for all the compartments that we checked so far. And, and since we know that there is like the ubiquitin and the proteasomal subunit, we think that's a previously unknown cellular response to an amino acid starvation. But okay. we are still, of course, trying to further investigate that. Okay, so, the, so there's still a lot to Yes, do <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Thank you very much, Laura Hinsel. Thank you. So, <clears throat> we are um, approaching the end of this symposium and we are entering into our second panel discussion uh, in which we would like to discuss a bit about tumor therapy and personalized medicine. Now, personalized medicine has been a buzzword since uh, or for almost two decades now, um, and uh, many people uh, say it has the potential to revolutionize medicine, but my question it is, has it? Uh, let's look uh, at data from the American Cancer Society. Cancer um, in the U.S. Uh, still, um, there are still almost two million uh, cancer cases each year uh, in the U.S., but uh, the peak rate of um, 
cancer mortality has been back in 1991, and since then there has been a decline in 31% in cancer mortality. But is it due to therapy or is it due to prevention? Let's say because fewer people smoke. Is it due to diagnosis because, for example, low-dose uh, computer tomography in uh, lung screening has been very proven to be very uh, effective in lung cancer screening? Or is it really due to um, successes in um, targeted therapy? Um, we only recently, or well, since, since several years, know that checkpoint inhibition also is effective against lung cancer. What are your um, perspectives here? What do you think how um, effective is or has the promise of personalized medicine been fulfilled during these last two decades since it first came up with trastuzumab or um, um, kinase inhibitors like, uh, oh, I, got, I forgot the name, but uh, you know which I mean, imatinib, I think it was the first one at the end of the 90s, okay. Well, I'm happy to start with this question. <laughs> So I, I really think it's a combination of all of what you just said. I mean, it's definitely a matter of prevention. It's definitely a better um, also diagnosing. Like we are much better in, in early on diagnosing cancer, you know? And, yes. and of course, if you don't have metastases in terms of solid cancers, then of course you have a higher rate of success. Mm. And for me, from my personal standpoint, um, also the personalized medicine is always a, a perspective in terms of when we're treating patients, we are giving them chemotherapy, and of course this is toxic. And, and it's always a balance between being aggressive enough to kill all cancer cells, but on the other side, we of course have the toxic side effects of chemotherapy. And I think what we really need to get better in is defining the subpopulations of patients that don't have that high of a risk of relapsing and getting again their disease so that we can reduce our treatment but then also can identify the high-risk profile patients. And I think this, is, at least from my perspective, is also a step of personalized medicine for the future, mm. that we're going to get better in distinguishing these patients. And, you, know, you do the diagnostic and you can more specifically select uh, what, to, what antibody, whether you can use it or not. Yes. And, um, and, and uh, of course, you know, the education is also, is now is much better and then the people will go for, you know, screening, uh, like, you know, uh, colonoscopy and others, and then you can avoid. And then what you just said, checkpoint inhibitors, I remember when I came to Germany, in that time it was like all of the presentation was that somebody has a lung cancer, it was, you know, no help. Yeah. And yeah. know that the checkpoint inhibitors yeah. helping, and mm -hmm. so you know the science is advancing, the uh, diagnostic and more specific uh, therapies, as well as educated the public and uh, avoid you know. But yesterday, um, in our press conference, at our press conference, uh, Thomas Böhm, the chair of the Scientific Council, mm -hmm. said uh, tumor cells are the superstars of biology because they always know. Uh, and, and, and find uh, ways uh, to escape and, and are so creative uh, to develop uh, um, measures against uh, therapy that it's really a challenge uh, to, even, to catch them even when you have personalized medicine. What, what are your um, impressions uh, or um, opinions, uh, Bonnie and Elvira? So I, I think that it, not only for tumor, but also for all the other um, diseases, also neurodegenerative diseases, there's a big effort worldwide with the human cell atlas to find something that we can use, you know, to kind of describe patients and stratify them and see which therapy we may want to use. But I think we're just in the beginning because usually people take transcriptomic approaches, right? What does a cell express? But it's just a snapshot. Yeah. And, and we need to go further. We need to look at lipids of the cells, on proteins, on what do they maybe, you know, also the microbiome. Uh, I think we need to put everything at once and it will cost a lot of money to, to find the one specific treatment for one specific person, but I hope one day it will be possible, yeah. But if we now also integrate the microbiome or the microbiota, um, this becomes so complicated, um, I mean, if all these um, 30 billion 
bacteria in our gut more than cells in our brain, neurons in our brain, are somehow involved in uh, causing cancer or preventing us from cancer, how shall we ever be able to understand the metabolism of cancer cells? Or is this a question which is not um, um, adequate to ask? So, well, yeah, it's a good, an enormously challenging problem. But how personalized does personalized medicine have to be, right? That's the real question. Or could you figure out principles, right? A few principles that kind of work for many, many people, right? Because if we have to understand every single person's personalized microbiome, yeah. forget, forget it, right? But, but there just might be a few rules that you have to get right. And of course, we're nowhere close to that yet. Right, in addition to the human part, right? But, and yeah. is it affordable at all? I mean, yeah, we well, have, of course, yeah. let's say CAR T cell therapies are theoretically fantastic, practically almost, uh, or very, very difficult yeah. to apply um, and almost not um, affordable. Um, will this, um, in the development of science and, and uh, drugs become, uh, or gene therapies become uh, cheaper in the future or more affordable? I mentioned for the CAR-T, you know, it was just last month was published by yeah. uh, University of Pennsylvania. They generated in vivo. Yeah. They made the CAR-T in vivo, so they delivered the particle which had the RNA, which had the targeting to pick up by the T cells, and then the T cells will have the receptor was generated. So that's make, the RNA actually is, is so, makes all of these uh, drugs but, but, so affordable. But nevertheless, it is still the CAR T cell therapy individually applied. I right? mean, it, it was an animal study. What I am yeah. telling you that why it was so expensive, because you had to take out the person's cells and for, you know, culturing, transfecting, making the virus, whatnot, you know, that everything to create yeah. makes it so expensive. But if it will be more affordable, and I think that the RNA is good for that because the, to making RNA is cheap, because every RNA, whether it is vaccine or whatnot, yeah. you have to use the same technology. Just for four nucleotides, you know, the order of is what is different. And, and so in the RNA future is also that how you will uh, uh, wrap up the RNA to protect and then put something on the wrapping material, the lipid or something, so put something which will target to specific cells. And that's what, for example, was done in this study. At BioNTech, uh, you are pursuing a, an approach with FixWEC, where you awesome. have a, a <laughs> kind of a generalized uh, personal medicine. That means you have a mix of certain antigens, tumor mm -hmm. antigens, which uh, yes. are quite... Um, which occur quite often mm -hmm. in, in, in a lot of patients and you try to make uh, this personalized mRNA tumor therapy affordable by not having it really individually yeah. personalized mm -hmm. but uh, a bit more generally personalized, so exactly. to say. Exactly. So that will, the, will this be mm -hmm. a possibility? It, it is already happening. It is in the pipeline, yeah, but it is not yet on the market. Uh, well. Yes, because it takes time. And, uh, but yeah. now that, you know, the RNA <laughs> okay. get in the forefront, and okay. uh, so we, you will see uh, more I mean, and more. Yeah. I mean, it would, it would, of course, really be something new, because until now we have just kinase inhibitors. We had the promise of uh, um, multi-kinase inhibitors sometimes with sunitinib or zoafenib and we had uh, other kinase inhibitors later, and we have monoclonal antibodies. There, is, um, in, there are no really new therapies, and now, I mean, in, in terms of, of a drug classes, right? Um, and um, now we have mRNA not as a drug class, but as a carrier of information, not as a magic bullet, but as a magic cult, so to say. Uh, where you can have many bullets loaded if mm -hmm. you if you like to. Um, yes, of is course. Is this really the future, um, uh, the, the promising future of uh, for for cancer patients who still? Um, I, I think so, and uh, you know it is. Um, 
what I mentioned is the affordability is the RNA, but also it is accelerating. So it is, you know, making an RNA is uh, one, two hours, and then you can screen, test. So it is uh, much cheaper than to synthesize the protein, purify, and they are sticking, and they are very different. So the RNA is very simple to make. Yeah. And then you can, even if eventually some pr product, final product would be a protein, but screening and testing is still the RNA accelerate and uh, much cheaper. And so many things. So, so we mentioned that it codes for a protein, maybe something on the, you know, like a CAR T. But also, not just the protein could be the product, could be, you know, the S enzyme and making something, the quorum, or making, like yeah. what I was yeah. doing, uh, you know, nitric oxide synthase mRNA, which will be help yeah. to dilate the blood vessel. This was vessel. in your neurosurgery time. Where yes, you, where, yeah, that uh, yeah. subarachnoid hemorrhage causing a major yeah. vessel mm. constriction, and we thought that if we deliver the mRNA coding for a, a nitric oxide synthase, locally release a product, which is millisecond half-life, but it will dilate locally. Okay. So there are many things. Maybe if I, if I may ask, but why do you think then so far uh, mRNA has not been successful in cancer, like as a broad uh, application? What was the limitation in your opinion so far? Mm -hmm. So, so the, for the cancer vaccine, you have to identify what should be the target. What should you target? And the, for the uh, infectious disease, you see that Moderna, BioNTech, everybody who 150 uh, different places uh, develop a vaccine. Everybody was targeting that protein because everybody knew that that's the surface of the virus and it is very easy. But for cancer, it is not, you know, some cases antibody, but most of the cancer cells won't put uh, on their surfaces very specific protein that you can target, but uh, you have to have cellular immunity. Yeah, but also every cancer is heterogeneous, and this is always the problem, right? So again, we're in a personalized me medicine, and then you need to take samples and find out. So it's, again, very, very expensive, But right? even but when, not, not that expensive, but even you do that, you have to identify which is the driver mutation mm. so that you can uh, eliminate some cells, and then but the tumor still can grow. And so it takes time. So... Just like for HIV, you know, we try to develop vaccines for 30 years and still it's not there. And people, that's why they question that maybe this, uh, you know, vaccine, probably not good. You work so much on the other one, but yeah, because it is very tricky. Because what you can target is covered with sugar and what you can really can access peptide protein there, those change and then the viruses can proliferate. So mm. the challenge, the understanding, and we are doing that. So I, you know, at BioNTech, we have not just the fixed vaccine, but individualized cancer vaccine. So do you think it sounds as if uh, mRNA sometimes replaces all the other drug classes? No. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and other drugs. Actually, you heard that both BioNTech, Pfizer, yeah. and uh, Moderna announced to make a uh, you know, vaccine for shingles. Yes. Which is already, we have a Shingrix, it's a yeah, good but, vaccine. But, but look so at, at Laura's uh, research uh, um, results, for example. I mean, GSK3 alpha inhibition seems, I, I, I mean, uh, seems to be a good uh, mm -hmm. uh, thing to do. And this is done by kinase inhibitors, obviously, and there is no mRNA in play. Um, or yeah, I am just saying that so many things you yeah. can do, you know, that... No, I'm, I'm just playing the devil's advocate here, mm -hmm. so... Yeah. It, um, okay, that's... Um, but, but, um, Listen, that, not, not for everything. Yeah. I don't think that, for, for example, for insulin, because when you have the therapeutic window very narrow, yeah. you overdose or underdose, you know, I, I think it will be difficult yes. to yet deliver the RNA. But uh, for many things, you know, you have to realize that the, tar the product is the... You know, this is the medicine because the RNA is just yes, code yes, for it. Yes. And, you know, maybe the RNA is gone, I mentioned, like uh, three, four days. Yes. But uh, there are many protein, many of the extracellular protein is half, half a year is the half-life. Oh. So you can, you know, and, and, and also they can generate, you know, like red blood cells, which is, again, you know, the EPO or, or uh, other cases that um, we already know that Intelia used uh, gene therapy with the nucleoside modified mRNA, Cas9, they targeted the amyloidosis, this uh, transteratin amyloidosis, and three patients for one year is not making that toxic protein. 
Oh. And already, just uh, like a week ago, they announced that even after one year, they are still stable. So even the, you know, the dream of uh, gene therapy will be solved with RNA. You, you are skeptic. You are looking skeptic as we are, right? I'm um, trying to find out where to buy more uh, shares of BioNTech. You, know? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you should have. You should have done by the end of 2019. <laughs> so, uh, when they were listed at the New York Stock Exchange, but uh, I think uh, yeah, this uh, everybody thinks so. I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but okay. Um, so we are all somehow hoping that mRNA. Um, Drugs will deliver, nevertheless, even when pursuing um, now personalized medicine approaches, we still rely on antibodies like uh, with checkpoint inhibition mm -hmm. or even on kinase inhibitors. Um, and, and we should still do so because there is one question here from the audience which has been, which, which mm -hmm. uh, refers to the affordability we have already mentioned, but. Um, I mean, the financial efforts are extremely high, and the pharmaceutical industry, of course, um, is making most of its sales by, uh, I guess, at least by, by uh, selling cancer drugs that then, am I wrong or not, just prolongs life by three months or four months or six months? Um, this is not bad. It is a progress. but. Um, how much does it cost um, every year and how much does our health insur insurance system has to pay for cancer therapy? So um, the more personalized it gets, the more expensive it will be. Is this right or is this wrong? Or but if we make it RNA, it gets, the price goes down. Okay. You know, you yeah. said, you know, all of these uh, yeah. protein-based, the antibodies, the uh, inhibitor, checkpoint, you can deliver us an mRNA. You are, you are just conducting this study with uh, resistant, with, with um, melanoma, I guess, resistant to checkpoint inhibitors, now together with an mRNA um, um, uh, treatment, right? Um, uh, is it public? Because it, I, you know. There was, there was something mentioned okay. yesterday at the press conference, I remember, yeah. and so um, mm -hmm. yeah. it, it obviously was, was public. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Um, um, and, and so th th there seems to be a possibility of combining uh, this. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I also, of course, I don't, can't tell the future, but I just think about things like I mean, we're just not very good at it yet, right? And the technology is changing, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And like I just think about like DNA sequencing or computer chips, you know, and, and memory, you know, like the price yeah. going down, like. You know, like we always were like, could you ever, you know, sequence a human genome for two billion dollars or whatever? To, you know, like now it's a it's a dimonucleotide or whatever whatever it is. And so maybe there is a horizon that's like that. And and for sure, it's going to be very expensive to learn. You know, but if we get good at a few of these technologies, one can imagine, perhaps, yeah. that that it becomes much more efficient and less expensive. Right, you know, there's seven billion people in the world, so yeah. you know you want access for everybody. If we can do these things, but no, I mean, cancer has all obviously uh, witnessed a progress in, in in treatment, or there have been less deaths by cancer now, and so it is foreseeable that, as you say, progress of technology will um, bring us forward. Now let's just look. Um, at Alzheimer's, for example, okay. Alzheimer's certainly there has been almost no progress since the development of uh, acetylcholine acetylase inhibitors in the early 90s, which which did not really uh, cure, which, which just uh, uh, halted the disease. Does your research, for example, uh, offer new ways um, to deal? with neurodegeneration and with the cause of neurodegeneration and then perhaps lead to an application where this disease from which many people are even more affected than by cancer can be at least treated if not cured. Yeah, for sure, because as I said, neuroscientists for, have thought for decades that it has to be the neurons. <coughs> I think now more and more, especially at the University of Bonn, there are a lot of people focusing on Alzheimer's diseases. 
and have developed inflammasome inhibitors, for instance, that are very specific to microglia, to macrophages, right, to target it. I think for the brain, it's very important to have also something passing the blood-brain barrier or reaching the brain at least. So that, that's, but people are working on this. I think that microglia and macrophages will be prime candidate to, to really treat this disease. What we do need is better models because the yes. problem is that so far things have failed because they work in, in mouse models, but then they fail in clinical trials. And there's always hope and then, you know, it does not work. Yeah. I think we need to develop better models to really start treating patients. So, but, so yeah. to move more into real world conditions, so to say, also? That as well, maybe organoids, you know, yeah. different things that are really human related. Um, yeah. mouse mo new mouse models, new organoid models, but also something like personalized medicine where we sequence maybe something that's worth and not to, okay. too much money, yeah. Um, we are running out of time again. I'm sorry, I would like to leave the last word in this panel to you because you are the youngest here and you have many approaches <laughs> uh, 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 in, in tumor therapy. Uh, what are your hopes for treating leukemia um, and uh, cancers of children in the next um, 20, 30, 40 years? What, what progress will we see? We have already seen much progress since the 1960s, but what will come? I, like, as I said earlier in the panel discussion, my hope would be that we can better stratify our patients. It doesn't matter like, which, which subtype of cancer, like if it's leukemia or other types of cancer to really have a better chance of reducing the toxicity of patients that don't need that much of treatment that they actually get, but also that we better characterize the patients that need higher dosages or other treatment approaches so that we can somehow get better in, in you know, for example, biomarker development and then somehow by that doing this um, improvement of, of survival rates. Thank you very much for this uh, statement. So let's uh, do more stratification genetically and then uh, see. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <coughs> Ladies and uh, gentlemen, um, I uh, like to thank you out there in cyberspace for joining us today. Chemical words, biological messages, signaling pathways, the overarching theme of this symposium has been communication. As we have seen, communication is not an evolved trait only. It is a prerequisite for evolution. It is not necessarily a question of friend or foe, but of mutual understanding. That's why we have deliberately chosen Ehrlich's term, original term, Zauberkugel, as the title of this conference today. The translation magic bullet sounds a bit too militaristic, especially in those days. By contrast, Zauberkugel evokes the enchantment associated with the elucidation of nature's secrets, with listening to the music of life. And Paul Ehrlich will surely have known Eichendorff's famous poem, Wishing Wand, schläft ein Lied in allen Dingen, die da träumen, fort und fort, und die Welt hebt an zu singen, triffst du nur das Zauberwort, freely translated from my side, sleeps a song in everything which is wanting to be heard, and the world begins to sing if you hit the magic word. And uh, I think words are better than bullets sometimes. Robert, uh, you as the host have the last word. Thanks for organizing this symposium. Please give us your concluding remarks. Yeah, thanks Joachim um, for this. You said basically everything. Uh, I hope that the conference, uh, the symposium was really an inspiration. Um, we planned it for all the students particular for the next generation to have a lively discussion to meet the laureates, uh, the awardees, see a role model, see where the future goes. Unfortunately, we had to go to this kind of platform where at least there is a little interaction between all of us. Um, it should be inspiration for the next generation indeed. Also for young scientists, please apply. Um, and don't give up. Don't give up, even row if you don't see where you row to. 
Um, also take it the serendipity in a way when you see something, take it up, um, allow independence for young scientists to, to develop their own, own field. Uh, Paul Ehrlich almost 100 years ago quoted it a little bit like in the Hygiene concept. We all talk about 2G and Paul Ehrlich had the four Gs in German. Glück, Geduld, Geschick und Geld. Luck, patience, skill and money. So with that uh, anecdote I would like to close with basically three big compliments. First of all, our very distinguished guest, Bonnie Basler, Elvira Maas, Kati Karicho, and Laura Hinze, um, for their very brilliant contribution, uh, sharing the insights in what's going on in research at the moment, and also the discussion where we may actually step in to the future, clearly following some aspects of Paul Ehrlich. I particularly like to thank Joachim Peach for elegantly and charmingly um, sharing the session. Also get the questions integrated. A big applause also on your side. <laughs> and of course, the last compliment goes to our virtual uh, audience for listening, for asking questions. And I'd like to thank the team in the back. There are so many helpers. And I can only say I'm impressed. You did a very, very good job. And so thanks a lot. <laughs> On the half, behalf of all of us, I wish you the very best for the future with a hope for better times and hopefully good solutions. Thanks a lot. <laughs>